Chapter 26. Harden. Today has been hell. A hell that I welcomed with open arms, but hell all the same. I never expected to see Tessa when I came home from the airport. I had come up with a simple lie, my girlfriend wouldn't be available, because she'd be out of town all week for Christmas. My mum had whined a little, but didn't ask too many questions or push my story. She had been so thrilled, and surprised, really, that I had a woman in my life. I think her, and my father both expected me to be alone my entire life. Then again, so did I I find it amusing, in a twisted way, that I can't go a second without thinking of this girl when up until three months ago I wanted to be alone. I never knew what I was missing, and now that I found it, I can't let it go. It's only her, though, no matter what I do, I can't shake her. I tried to stop, tried to forget about her, tried to move on, and it was a disaster. The perfectly nice blonde that I took out Saturday night wasn't Tessa. No one would ever be. Sure, she looked like her, even dressed like her, she blushed when I cursed and seemed a little afraid of me throughout our dinner. She was nice enough, yeah, but she was boring. She was missing, that fire that Tess has, she didn't scold me for my foul language, she didn't even say anything, when I put my hand on her thigh in the middle of dinner. I knew she only agreed to go out with me to fulfill some fucked up bad boy fantasy before church the next morning, but that's okay, because I was using her too. I was using her to fill the void of Tessa. To distract me from Tessa, being in Seattle still with fucking Trevor. The guilt I felt when I moved in to kiss her was overwhelming. I pulled away, and the embarrassment was clear on her innocent face, I practically ran to my car, leaving her stranded at the restaurant. I sit up further, and look at the sleeping girl, that I am desperately in love with. Seeing her in our apartment with her clothes in the washer, the apartment clean, and even her toothbrush in the bathroom it gave me a little bit of hope. But then again, you know what they say about hope. I'm still holding on to the sliver that exists, the small chance that she may forgive me. If she woke up now, she would surely scream at the sight of me standing over her as she sleeps. I know I need to take it down a few notches. I need to give her a little space. This behavior and these feelings are so exhausting, so overwhelming to me, and I have no fucking idea how to deal with them. But I will figure this out, I have to fix all of this. I push a loose strand of her soft hair from her face, and force myself away from the bed, back to my pile of blankets, on the concrete floor, where I belong. Maybe I'll be able to sleep tonight. Chapter 27. Tessa. When I wake up, I'm momentarily confused by the brick ceiling above me. It's strange to wake up here, after staying in hotels for the past week. When I climb out of bed, the floor is clear, with a blanket and pillows piled next to the closet. Grabbing my toiletry bag, I head to the bathroom. I hear Hardin's voice from the living room, she can't stay today, mum. Her mother is expecting her. Couldn't we have her mom come here? I would love to meet her, Trish responds. Oh no. No, her mother is not very fond of me, he says. Why not? She doesn't think I'm good enough for Tessa, I guess. And maybe because of how I look. How you look? Hardin, don't you ever let anyone make you feel insecure. I thought you loved your style? I do. I mean, I don't give a shit what anyone thinks. Except Tessa. As my mouth falls open, Trish laughs. Who are you, and where is my boy? Then, with real happiness in her voice, she says, I can't even remember the last conversation we had, where you didn't curse me out, it's been years. This is nice. Okay okay Hardin groans, and I giggle, while imagining Trish trying to hug him. After my shower I decide to get myself all the way ready, before leaving the bathroom. I'm a coward, I know, but I need a little more time, before I put on a fake smile for Hardin's mother. It's not exactly a fake smile, and that's part of the problem. My subconscious reminds me. I had a really nice time yesterday, and I slept better than I have all week. Once my hair is curled to near perfection, I pat my toiletries back into my small bag. There's a light tap on the door. Tess? Hardin asks. I'm finished, I respond and open the door, to find him leaning against the door, wearing long grey cotton shorts and a white t-shirt. Not to rush you or anything, 
but I really have to piss. He gives me a small smile and I nod. I try not to notice the way his shorts hang on his hips, making the cursive writing that's inked onto his side even more visible under the white t-shirt. I'm going to get dressed, then be on my way, I tell him. He looks away, focusing on the wall. Okay. I go to the bedroom, feeling terribly guilty about lying to his mother and leaving so soon. I know she was so excited to meet me, and here I am leaving on her second day. Deciding on my white dress, I put on my old black tights underneath since it's too cold without them. I probably should just put on jeans and a sweatshirt, but I love that the dress gives me a strange sense of confidence, which is something that I need today. I pack my clothes back into my bags and place the hangers back in the closet. Do you need some help? Trish says from behind me. I jump, dropping the navy dress that I wore in Seattle. I was just I fumble. Her eyes examine the half-empty closet. How long are you planning on being at your mother's? Oh my I'm a really terrible liar. Looks like you're going to be gone for a while. Yeah I don't have many clothes, I squeak. I was going to see if you wanted to do some shopping while I was here. Maybe if you come back before I leave, we can go. I can't tell if she believes me or if she suspects that I don't ever plan on returning here. Yes yeah, sure, I lie again. Mum Hardin says in a low voice as he enters the room. I notice his frown as his eyes take in the empty closet and hope that Trish isn't observing her son the way that I am. Just finishing packing, I explain, and he nods. I sit the last bag and look at him, completely unsure what I should say. I'll take your bags down for you, he says, grabbing my keys from the dresser and disappearing with my things. As he leaves, Trisha's arms wrap around my shoulders. I'm so glad that I got to meet you, Tessa. You have no idea what it means to me as a mother to see my only child this way. What way? I manage to ask. Happy, she replies and my eyes begin to sting. If this is happy Harden to her, I don't want to see her usual Harden. I say my final goodbye to Trish and prepare to leave the apartment for the last time. Tessa? Hardin's mother says plainly. I turn around to face her once more. You'll come back to him, won't you? She asks, and my heart sinks. I get the feeling she means more than coming back after Christmas break. I don't trust my voice. So I just nod and quickly exit. When I reach the elevator, I turn around and head to the stairs to avoid seeing Hardin. I wipe the corners of my eyes and take a deep breath before walking out into the snow. When I reach my car, I notice that the windshield has been cleared of snow and the engine is running. I decide not to call my mother to tell her that I'm on my way. I don't feel like talking to her right now. I want to use this two-hour drive to try to clear my head. I need to make a mental list of the pros and cons of being with Hardin again. I know how stupid I am for even entertaining the thought he has done terrible things to me. He has lied to me, betrayed me, and humiliated me. So far, on the cons list we have the lies, the sheets, the condom, the bet, his temper, his friends, Molly, his ego, his attitude, and him destroying my trust. On the pros list I have well I have the fact that I love him. That he makes me happy, makes me feel stronger, more confident. That he usually wants the best for me, unless, of course, He's the one doing the damage in his reckless way the way he laughs and smiles, the way he holds me, the way he kisses me, the way he hugs me, the way I can tell he is changing for me. I know my pros list is full of small things, especially compared to the large negatives, but the small things are the most important, right? I can't decide if I'm completely insane for even thinking about forgiving him or if I'm doing what love dictates, which will guide me best in love my feelings or my mind. As much as I try to fight it, I can't stay away from him. I never have been able to. This would be a good time to have a friend to talk to, a friend that has been in this type of situation before. I wish I could call Steph, but she lied to me the whole time too. I would call Landon, but he's already told me his opinion, and sometimes a woman's point of view is better, more relatable. The snow is thick, and the wind is strong, nudging at my car on the deserted roads. I should have just stayed in the hotel, I have no idea what possessed me to come here. 
Still, despite some scary moments, the drive goes much quicker than I thought it would, and before I know it, my mother's house looms before me. I pull into her neatly shoveled driveway, and after three knocks she finally opens the door, wearing a robe, her hair wet. I can count the times in my life that I've seen her without her hair and makeup done on one hand. What are you doing here? Why didn't you call? She fires off, as unfriendly as ever. I step inside. I don't know. I was driving through the snow and didn't want to be distracted. You still should have called, so I could have been ready. You don't need to be ready, it's only me. She huffs. There is never an excuse to look like a slob, Tessa, she says with a tone, as if she's telling me about my current state. I almost laugh at her ridiculous comment, but I decide against it. Where are your bags, she asks. In my car, I'll get them later. What is that that dress you are wearing? Her eyes scan. My body and I smile. It's for work. I really like it. It's way too revealing, but the color is nice, I suppose. Thanks. So how are the porters? I ask. I know bringing up Noah's family will distract her. They're great. They miss seeing you. As she goes into the kitchen she says casually over her shoulder, maybe we should invite them over for dinner tonight. I cringe and scurry after her. Oh, I don't think that's a good idea. She looks at me, then pours herself cup of coffee. Why not? I don't know it would be awkward for me. Teresa, you have known the porters for years. I would love for them to see you now that you have an internship as well as going to college. So you basically want me to show off? The thought annoys me. She only wants to have them over, so she can have another thing to brag about. No, I want to show them the things that you've accomplished. It's not showing off, she snaps. I really would rather not. Well, Teresa, this is my house, and if I want to invite them, I will. I'm going to finish getting myself presentable, and then I'll be back. And with a dramatic turn, she leaves me in the kitchen alone. I roll my eyes and walk back to my old bedroom. Tired, I lie down on the bed and wait for my mother to finish her extensive beautification rituals. Teresa? My mother's voice wakes me up. I don't even remember falling asleep. I lift my face up from where it was resting on Buddha, my ancient stuffed elephant, and say a disoriented coming. I drowsily get to my feet and wobble down the hall. When I reach the living room, Noah is sitting on the couch. Not the entire Porter clan, as my mother had threatened, but this does wake me up. Look who stopped by while you were napping, my mother says, smiling her fakest smile. Hey, I reply, but I'm really thinking, I knew I shouldn't have come here. Noah waves a slight hand at me. Hey, Tessa, you look great. Of course, I have no problem with Noah at all, I care for him deeply, like a family member. But I need a break from everything going on in my life, and him being here only adds to my guilt and pain. I know it isn't his fault, and it's not fair for me to be short with him, especially when he's been so kind throughout our whole breakup. My mother leaves the room, and I pull my shoes off, and sit down on the couch, opposite Noah. How's your break going, he asks. Good, yours? Same. Your mom said you went to Seattle? Yeah, it was great. I went with my boss and some co-workers. He nods excitedly. That's awesome, Tessa. I'm happy for you, you're really doing the publishing thing. Thank you. I smile. This isn't as awkward as I thought it would be. After a moment, he looks down the hall where my mother disappeared, then leans in close. Hey, so, your mom has been so tense since Saturday. I mean more than usual. How are you doing with all of this? I scrunch up my brows. What do you mean? The whole thing with your dad, he says slowly like I know what he's talking about. What? My dad? She didn't tell you? He looks down the empty hall. Oh don't tell her I told, before he can finish, I'm on my feet and storming down the hallway to her room. Mother. What the hell about my dad? I haven't seen or heard from him in eight years. The way Noah was acting kind of solemn did he die? I don't know how I'd feel about that. What about dad? I raise my voice as I burst into her room. Her eyes go wide, but she composes herself quickly. Well? I shout. She rolls her eyes. Tessa, you need to lower your voice. 
It is nothing, nothing that you need to worry about. That's not for you to decide, tell me what's going on. Is he dead? Dead? Oh no. I would tell you if he was, she says and drops a hand, as if to poo-poo me. Then what is it? She sighs and looks at me for a second. He's moved back. Not too far from where you are now, but he won't be contacting you, so don't you worry about it. I took care of it. What does that even mean? I don't have enough space in my head for all of this crap with Hardin, and now my absentee father is moving back to Washington. Now that I think about it, I didn't know he moved away in the first place. I only knew he wasn't around me. It doesn't mean anything. I was going to tell you, when I called you Friday night, but since you couldn't be bothered to pick up the phone, I handled it myself. I was too drunk to answer that night, thank goodness I didn't. I could have never handled this wasted. I can barely handle it now. He isn't going to bother you, so wipe that sad look off of your face and get ready, we're going to do some shopping, she says, too indifferently. I don't really want to go shopping, mother. This is sort of a big deal to me, you know. No, it isn't, she says, full of annoyance and venom. He hasn't been around for years. He still won't be around now, nothing has changed. She disappears into her closet, and I realize there's no use arguing with her. I walk back to the living room, grab my phone, and put my shoes on. Where are you guys going? Noah asks. Who knows, I say and walk out into the chill air. I wasted all this time coming here, two hours of driving in the snow, just to have her be a complete witch no, bitch. She's a complete bitch. I wipe the snow off my windshield with my arm. A terrible idea, since it only freezes me further. Climbing inside the car, I clench my rattling teeth as I start the engine and wait for it to heat up somewhat. As I drive, I scream, repeatedly calling my mother every foul name I can think of. When I've exhausted my voice, I try to figure out what to do next, but memories of my father flood my mind, and I can't concentrate on anything. Tears soaking my cheeks, I grab my phone off the passenger seat. In a few seconds, Hardin's voice booms through the small speaker. Tess? Are you okay? Yeah I start, but my voice betrays me, and I choke on a sob. What happened? What did she do? She can I come back? I ask, and he lets out a deep breath. Of course you can, baby Tessa. He corrects himself, but I find myself wishing we hadn't. How far are you, he asks. Twenty minutes, I cry. Okay, do you want to stay on the phone? No it's knowing, I explain and hang up. I shouldn't have left in the first place. It's ironic that I'm running to Hardin despite everything he has done. Far too long later, when I pull into the parking lot, I'm still crying. I wipe my face the best I can, but my makeup streaks and dirties my face. When I step out into the snow, I see Hardin standing by the door covered in snow. Without thinking, I run over and wrap my arms around him. He steps back, obviously thrown off by my affection, but then he wraps his arms around me and lets me cry into his snow-covered sweatshirt. Chapter 28. Hardin. Holding her for the first time in what seems like a lifetime is better than I could even begin to describe. Physical relief floods through me, when she runs into my arms, I never expected this to happen. She has been so distant, so cold lately. I don't blame her, but fuck if it hasn't hurt. Are you okay? I ask into her hair. She nods her head up and down against my chest, but continues to cry. I know she isn't okay. Her mother probably said some shit to her that she shouldn't have. I knew this would happen, and honestly, the greedy part of me is glad for whatever she did. Not because she hurt Tessa, but because it meant my girl ran to me for comfort. Let's go inside, I say. She nods but doesn't let go of me, so I force myself to release my arms from her and walk us both inside. Her beautiful face is marked with black streaks, and her eyes and lips are swollen. I hope she didn't cry the whole drive. As soon as we step into the lobby, I pull out the scarf I brought down and wrap it around her head and ears, making a soft purple bundle around her beautiful face. She must be cold only wearing that dress. That dress I would normally go into an extended fantasy about peeling the thin fabric off her. But not today, not while she's like this. 
she lets out the cutest hiccup and pulls the scarf over her head. Her blonde hair sticks up out of the side in a big knot, making her look even younger than usual. Do you want to talk about it? I take the small chance to ask her when we step off the elevator and walk down to her the apartment. She nods, and I unlock the door. My mum is sitting on the couch, and worry spreads across her face as she takes in Tess's appearance. I shoot her a warning glare, hoping she'll remember the promise she made to not bombard Tessa with questions about her return. Mum tears her eyes from Tessa and looks at the television, feigning indifference. We're going to go into the room for a little while, I announce, and my mum nods. I know it's driving her crazy not being able to talk, but I won't have her making Tessa feel any worse by prying. As we go, I pause at the thermostat in the hallway to turn the heat up, since I know she's freezing. When I step into the room, Tess is already sitting on the edge of the bed. Unsure of how close I'm allowed to get, I wait for her to say something. Harden, she says in a weak voice. The hoarse tone of her voice tells me she had been crying the whole drive, and it makes me feel worse for her. I go stand in front of her, and she surprises me again by grabbing hold of my t-shirt and pulling me to stand between her legs. This is more than her mum saying some rude shit. Tess what did she do? I ask as she starts crying again, smearing her makeup on the bottom of my white shirt. I could give a shit about the mess. If anything, it will give me a reminder of her when she leaves again. My dad she croaks, and I go rigid. Dear dad? If he was there Tessa, was he there? Did he do something to you? I ask her through my teeth. She shakes her head no, and I reach down to lift her chin up forcing her to look at me. She's never quiet, even when upset. That's usually when she's the most vocal. He moved back here, but I didn't even know he left. I mean, I guess I did, but I never thought about it. I never thought about him. My voice is not as calm as I mean for it to be when I ask, did you talk to him today? No, she did, though. She said he isn't going to come near me, but I don't want her making that choice for me. Do you want to see him? All of the things she has told me about this man have been negative. He was violent, often smacking her mum around in front of her. Why would she want to see him? No well, I don't know. But I want to be the one to decide. She dabs at her eyes with the back of her hand. Not that you would even want to see me the instinct to hunt this man down and make sure he doesn't. Come near her takes over, and I have to talk myself down before I do something stupid and brash. I can't help but think, what if he's like your dad? What do you mean? What if he's different now? What if he doesn't drink anymore? The hope in her voice breaks my heart well, what's left of it? I don't know that usually doesn't happen, I tell her honestly. I see the way her mouth turns down at the ends, so I continue, but it could. Maybe he's different now I don't believe it, but who am I to extinguish her hope? I didn't know you had any interest in him. I don't well. I didn't. I'm just angry, because my mother kept it from me she says, and then, between bouts of wiping her nose and face against my shirt, she tells me the rest of what happened. Tessa's mother is the only woman who would reveal the return of her alcoholic ex-husband, and then promptly mention going shopping. I keep my mouth shut about Noah being there, even though it pisses me off. That kid just won't seem to go away. Finally she looks up at me, a bit calmer. She seems much better than she was when she ran to me in the parking lot, and I would like to think that's because she's here with me. It's okay that I'm here, right? She asks. Yeah, of course. You can stay as long as you need to. It is your apartment, after all. I try to smile, and surprisingly she returns the gesture, before wiping her nose on my shirt again. I should have a dorm room next week. I nod. If I speak, I'll end up pathetically begging her not to leave me again. Chapter 29. Tessa. I walk to the bathroom to remove the makeup from my face and pull myself together. The warm water washes away all evidence of my eventful morning, and I'm actually glad to be back here. Despite everything that Hardin and I have been through, I'm glad to know that I still have a safe place to land with him. He is the only constant in my life. I remember him saying that to me once. I wonder if he meant it then. Even if he didn't, I believe that he feels that way now. I just wish he would tell me more about how he feels. 
seeing him break down yesterday was the most emotion that I've seen out of him since we met. I just want to hear the words behind the tears. I go back into the bedroom to find Hardin setting my bags down on the floor. I went down and got your stuff, he informs me. Thank you, I really hope I'm not intruding, I tell him, and bend down to grab some sweats and a t-shirt. I have to get out of this dress. I want you here, you know that, don't you, he says quietly. I shrug and he frowns. You should know that by now, Tess. I do it's just that your mother is here, and here I am bringing all this drama and crying I explain. My mum is glad that you're here, and so am I. My chest swells, but I change the subject. Do you guys have anything planned today? I think she wanted to go to the mall or something, but we can go tomorrow. You can go, I can keep myself entertained. I don't want him to cancel plans with his mother when he hasn't seen her in over a year. No, it's fine, really. You don't need to be alone. I'm fine. Tessa, what did I just say? He growls and I look up at him. He seems to have forgotten that he doesn't get to decide things for me anymore. No one does. He softens and corrects himself. Sorry you stay here. I'll go shopping with her. Much better, I say and try to fight my smile. Hardin has been so gentle, so afraid the last few days. Even if he was wrong to push me, it was kind of nice to see he's still himself. I go into the closet to change my clothes, and just as I lift the dress over my head, he taps on the door. Tess? Yes? I say. After a beat he asks, you'll be here when we get back? I snort. Yeah. It's not like I have anywhere else to go. Okay. If you need anything, call me, he says. The sadness in his voice is clear. A few minutes later I hear the front door close, and I emerge from the bedroom. I probably should have gone with him, so I wouldn't be here alone with my thoughts. I already feel lonely. After watching television for an hour, I am beyond bored. Periodically my phone buzzes and my mother's name flashes on screen. I ignore her entirely, and wish Hardin would come back already. I grab my e-reader and start to read to pass the time, but I can't stop looking at the clock. I want to text Hardin and see how much longer they'll be, but instead I decide to make dinner to pass the time. I go into the kitchen to decide what to make, something that takes a while but is easy. Lasagna it is, then. Soon it's 8, then 8.30, and by 9 I'm already thinking again that I'll text him. What the hell is wrong with me? One fight with my mother and suddenly I'm back to clinging to Hardin? If I'm honest with myself, I know that I never truly stopped clinging to him. Even though I don't really want to admit it, I know that I'm not ready for a life without Hardin. I'm not going to jump into anything wholesale with him, but I'm exhausted from battling myself all the time over him. As terrible as he has been to me, I'm even more miserable without him than I was when I found out about the entire bet. Part of me is irritated at myself for my lack of strength, but another part can't deny how resolved I felt when I came back today. I still need a little time to think, to see how everything goes with us being around one another. I'm still so confused. 9.15. It's only 9.15, when I finish setting the table and cleaning up the mess I made in the kitchen. I'll text him, just once, a simple hey, how's it going, just to check on him. It's snowing, so I'm only texting him to check on him, you know, for safety reasons. Just as I pick up my phone, the front door opens. I set my phone down covertly as Hardin and his mom enter. So, how was shopping? I ask him at the same exact time that he says, you made dinner? Do you first, we both say and laugh. I hold up one hand and inform him and Trish, I made dinner. If you already ate, that's fine too. It smells so good in here, his mother says as she surveys the table full of food. Immediately she drops her bags and drops into a seat at the table. Thank you, Tessa dear. That mall was dreadful, all the last minute Christmas shoppers filled the place. Who waits until two days before Christmas to get their gifts? Um, you, Hardin answers and pours himself a glass of water. Oh, hush, she scolds and picks off the end of a breadstick to pop into her mouth. Hardin sits down next to his mother, and I take the chair across from her. Over dinner Trish talks about the shopping horrors they experienced, 
and how a man was tackled by security guards for trying to steal a dress from Macy's. Hardin swears that the dress was for the man himself, but Trish rolls her eyes and continues with the outlandish tale. I realize that the meal I prepared is actually quite good, better than usual, and almost the entire pan of lasagna is gone by the time the three of us finish. I had two servings myself, that's the last time I'll go all day without eating. Oh, we bought a tree, his mom says suddenly. Just a small one, but you two have to have a tree in your place, especially your first Christmas together. She claps her hands and I laugh. Even before everything fell apart, Hardin and I had never talked about getting a Christmas tree. I had been so distracted by moving in, and just by Hardin in general, that I nearly forgot. About the holidays altogether. Neither of us had taken any interest in Thanksgiving, him for obvious reasons and me, because I didn't want to spend it at my mother's church, so we ordered pizza and hung out in my dorm room. That's okay, right? Trish asks, making me realize I haven't responded. Oh yeah, of course it is, I tell her, and look at Hardin, who is just staring at his empty plate. Trish takes over the conversation again and I'm grateful. After a few more minutes she announces, well, as much as I'd love to stay awake with you party animals, I must get my beauty sleep. Thanking me again, and putting her plate into the sink, she bids us good night, before leaning down to kiss Hardin on his cheek. He groans and moves away, so her lips barely brush his skin, but she seems pleased with the small amount of contact. She wraps her arms around my shoulders, placing a kiss on the top of my head. Hardin rolls his eyes, and I kick him under the table. After she disappears I stand up and put away the few remaining leftovers. Thanks for making dinner. You didn't have to, Hardin tells me, and I nod, before we both head into the bedroom. I can sleep on the floor tonight since you did last night, I offer, even though I know he wouldn't actually let me sleep on the floor. No, it's fine. It's actually not so bad, he says I sit on the bed, and Hardin takes the blankets from the closet and lays them on the floor. I toss him two pillows, and he gives me a small smile, before unbuttoning his jeans. Oh, I definitely should look away. I don't exactly want to, but I know that I should. He pulls his black jeans down and steps out of them. The way his muscles move on his tattooed stomach as he bends down has me unable to look away, reminding me just how attracted I am to him, despite my anger. His black boxers cling to his skin, and his head snaps up to look at me. His face, hard and concentrated on mine, only feeds my trance. His jawline is so sharp, so intriguing. He's still staring. Sorry, I say, and jerk my head to the side, my cheeks flaring in humiliation. No, I'm sorry. Just a habit, I guess. He shrugs and pulls a pair of cotton pants from the dresser, I keep my eyes on the wall until he says good night, Tess and flicks the light off. I can practically hear the smirk in this tone. I'm awoken by a sharp sound and stare at the ceiling, I can barely see the blades of the fan moving through the darkness. Then I hear it again, Hardin's voice. No. Please, he whimpers. Shit, he's having one of his nightmares. I jump out of bed and kneel down beside his thrashing body. No, he repeats much louder this time. Harden. Harden, wake up. I say into his ear and shake his shoulders. His shirt is soaked with sweat, and his face twisted as he opens his eyes, sitting up immediately. Tessie breathes and pulls me into his arms. I rub my fingers through his hair, before bringing my hand down to his back. I gently run my hands up and down his back, my nails barely grazing his skin. It's okay, I tell him over and over again, and he hugs me tighter. Come on, let's go to bed, I say and stand up. Holding on to my t-shirt, he climbs into the bed with me. Are you okay? I ask him when he lies down. He nods and I pull him closer to me. Do you think you could get me some water, he asks. Of course. I'll be right back. I turn on the lamp, before climbing back out of the bed, then try to keep as quiet as possible so as not to wake Trish. But I get to the kitchen, she's already there. Is he okay? She asks. Yeah, he's okay now. I'm just getting him some water, I say to her, and fill up a glass in the sink. When I turn back around, 
She pulls me into a hug and kisses my cheek. Can we talk tomorrow? She asks. Suddenly I'm too nervous to speak, so I just nod, which makes her smile, though she sniffles as I walk off. Back in her room, Hardin looks slightly relieved when I return and thanks me as he takes the water from my hand. He gulps down the entire glass while I watch him and join him back on the bed. I can see how uneasy he is, likely from the nightmare, but I know part of it is because of me. Come here, I tell him, and see the relief in his eyes as he scoots his body toward mine, and I wrap my arms around him and put my head on his chest. It feels just as comforting to me as I imagine it does to him. Despite everything he has done, I feel like home in this flawed boy's arms. Don't let me go, Tess, he whispers and closes his eyes. Chapter 30. Tessa. I wake up sweating. Hardin's head is on my stomach, and his arms are in a bear hug around me. Surely his arms must be numb from my body weight. His legs are intertwined with mine, and he's snoring lightly. Taking a deep breath, I carefully lift my hand to brush his luscious hair from his forehead. I feel like I haven't touched his hair in so long, but in reality it's only been since Saturday. My mind replays the events in Seattle like a movie as I run my fingers through his soft mess of hair. His eyes flutter open, and I jerk my hand away quickly. Sorry, I say, embarrassed to be caught in the act. No, it felt good, he says, his voice thick from sleep. After gathering himself and breathing against my skin for a moment, he lifts himself up from me, too soon, and I wish I hadn't touched his hair, so he would still be asleep, holding me. I have some work to do today, so I'll be going to town for a little while, he says and grabs a pair of black jeans from the closet. He grabs his boots and slips them on quickly. I get the feeling that he's rushing out of here. Okay what? I thought he'd be happy that we slept together and that we held each other for the first time in a week. I thought something would have changed, not completely, but I thought maybe he could see that my resolve was wearing down, that I was a few steps closer to reconciling with him than I was yesterday. Yeah, he says, and twists his eyebrow ring between two fingers before pulling the white t-shirt over his head and grabbing a black one from the dresser. He doesn't say anything before he exits the room, leaving me confused once again. Of all the things I expected to happen, him running out like this wasn't one of them. What work could he possibly have to do right now? He reads manuscripts, the same as I do, only he has much more freedom to work from home, so why would he want to do it today? The memory of what Hardin was doing the last time he had to work makes my stomach turn. I hear him talking to his mother briefly before the front door opens and closes. I plop back onto the pillows and kick my feet in a childish manner. But hearing the siren song of caffeine, I finally climb out of bed and pad out into the kitchen to make some coffee. Good morning, sweetie, Trish chirps as I pass where she sits at the counter. Good morning. Thank you for making coffee, I say and grab the freshly brewed pot. Hardin said he had some work to do, she says, though it really sounds like she's asking, not telling. Yeah he said something about that, I reply, unsure what else to say. But she seems to ignore that and says, I'm glad he's okay after last night, her voice full of worry. Yeah, me too. Then, without thinking, I add, I shouldn't have made him sleep on the floor. Her brows knit together in question. He doesn't have the nightmares, when he isn't on the floor, she asks carefully. No, he doesn't have them, if we I trail off stirring the sugar into my coffee and trying to think of a way to talk myself out of this if you're there she finishes for me yeah if i'm there she gives me a hopeful look that so i'm told only a mother can give when talking about her children do you want to know why he has them i know he'll hate me for telling you but i think you should know oh please mrs daniels i swallow i don't really want to hear her tell me that story he told me about that night. I swallow when her eyes widen in surprise. He told you, she gasps. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to just say it that way. And the other night, I thought you knew I apologize and take another drink of coffee. No, no, don't apologize. I just can't believe he told you. Obviously you knew about the nightmares, but this this is astounding. 
She dabs her eyes with her fingers and smiles a smile straight from the heart. I hope it's okay. I'm so sorry for what happened. I don't want to intrude on their family secrets, but I also have never had to deal with anything like this before. It's more than okay, Tessa dear, she says and begins full on sobbing. I'm just so happy he has you, they were so bad, he would scream and scream. I tried to send him to therapy, but you know Hardin. He wouldn't speak to them. At all. As in not one word, he would just sit there and stare at the wall. I set my mug down on the counter and wrap my arms around her. I don't know what it was that made you come back yesterday, but I'm glad that you did, she says into my shoulder. What? She pulls back and gives me a wry expression and dabs at her eyes. Oh, honey, I'm old, but not that old. I knew something was going on between the two of you. I saw how surprised he was to see you when we arrived, and I could tell something was off when he said you weren't going to make it to England. I had a feeling that she was onto us, but I didn't know how transparent we were to her. I take a big gulp of my now lukewarm coffee and consider this. Trish tenderly grabs onto my other arm. He was so excited well, as excited as Hardin gets to bring you to England, and then a few days ago he said you were going out of town, but I knew better. What happened, she asks. I take another drink and make eye contact with her. Well I don't know what to tell her, because oh nothing, your son just took my virginity as a part of a bet, doesn't exactly feel helpful right now. He he lied to me is all I say. I don't want her to be upset with Hardin, and I don't really want to get into all of it with her, but I don't want to completely lie either. A big lie? A massive lie. She looks at me then like I'm a landmine. Is he sorry? Talking to Trish about this is strange. I don't even know her, and she's his mother, so she'll feel inclined to take his side no matter what. So I reply delicately, yeah I think he is, and drain the rest of my coffee. Has he said that he is? Yeah a few times. Has he shown it? Sort of. Has he? I know he broke down the other day, and he's been calmer than usual, but he hasn't actually said what I want to hear. The older woman looks at me, and for a moment I really fear what her response is going to be. But then she surprises me by saying, well, as his mother, I have to put up with his antics. But you don't. If he wants you to forgive him, then he needs to work for it. He needs to show you that he'll never again do anything like whatever it is that he did, and I figure it must have been a pretty big lie if you moved out. Try to keep in mind that emotion is not a place he goes to often. He's a very angry boy man now. I know the question sounds ridiculous, people lie all the time, but the words tumble out before my brain can process. Them, would you forgive someone for lying to you? Well, it would depend on the lie and how sorry they were. I will say that, when you allow yourself to believe too many lies, it's hard to find your way back to the truth. Is he saying I shouldn't forgive him? She taps her fingers on the counter lightly. However, I know my son, and I can see the change in him since the last time I saw him. He's changed the last few months, so much, Tessa. I can't even tell you how much. He laughs and smiles. He even engaged in conversation with me yesterday. Her smile is bright despite the serious subject. I know that, if he lost you, he would go back to how he was before, but I don't want you to feel obligated to be with him because of that. I don't feel obligated. I mean. I just don't know what to think. I wish I could explain the whole story to her, so I could have her honest opinion. I wish my mother was as understanding as Trish seems to be. Well, that's the hard part, you have to be the one to decide. Just take your time and make him work it, things come easily to my son, they always have. Maybe that's part of his problem, he always gets what he wants. I laugh because that statement couldn't be more true that he does. I sign go to the pantry and grab a box of cereal. But Trish interrupts my plan by saying, how about you and me get dressed and go get some breakfast and do some girl things? I could use a haircut myself. She laughs and shakes her brown hair back and forth. Her sense of humor is nice, just like Hardin's is when he allows it to show. He's more raunchy, yes, but I see where he gets his humor. Great. Let me just take a shower first, I say and put back the box. Shower? 
it's snowing outside, and we'll be getting our hair washed anyway. I was going to just wear this. She gestures to her black tracksuit. Throw on some jeans or something, and let's go. This is so different than if I was going anywhere with my mother. I would have to have ironed clothes, my hair curled, and makeup on, even if we were just going to the grocery store. I smile and say, okay. In the bedroom, I grab a pair of jeans and a sweatshirt from the closet, then pull my hair into a bun. Slipping on my toms, I head to the bathroom and quickly brush my teeth and splash cold water on my face. When I join Trish in the living room, she's ready and waiting by the door. I should leave Hart in a note or text him, I say. But she smiles and pulls me toward the door. That lad will be fine. After spending the rest of the morning and the majority of the afternoon with Trish, I feel much more relaxed. She is kind, funny, and great to talk to. She keeps the conversation light and has me laughing almost the entire time. We both get our hair done, and Trish adds bangs, daring me to do the same, but I refuse with a smile. I do, however, let her talk me into buying a black dress for Christmas. I have no idea what I'm doing for Christmas, though. I don't want to intrude on Hardin and his mother, and I haven't bought any presents or anything. I think I may take Landon up on the invitation to his house. It seems a little too much to spend Christmas with Hardin when we're not together. We're in this alien in-between stage, we aren't together, but I've been feeling like we were getting closer to each other until he left this morning. By the time we return to the apartment, Hardin's car is in the lot, and I start to feel nervous. When we get up to the apartment, we find him sitting on the couch with papers spread out across his lap in the coffee table. He has a pen between his teeth and looks deep into whatever it is that he's doing. Working, I suspect, but I have only actually seen him work a few times in the months I've known him. Hello, son. Trish says in a cheery voice. Hey, Hardin responds flatly. Did you miss us? She teases, and he rolls his eyes before gathering up the loose pages and shoving them into a binder. I'll be in the bedroom, he huffs and stands from the couch. I shrug at Trish, then follow Hardin into our bedroom. Where'd you guys go? He asks and sets down his binder on the dresser. A page falls out, and he quickly shoves it back inside, closing the tab with a snap. I sit on the bed with my legs crossed. To breakfast, then we got haircuts and did some shopping. Oh, where did you go? I ask him. He looks down at the floor before answering. To work. Tomorrow is Christmas Eve. I'm not buying that, I say with a tone that tells me Trish must have worn off on me. His green eyes blaze at me. Well, I don't really care if you're not buying that, he says in a mocking tone and sits down on the opposite side of the bed. What's your problem? I snap. Nothing. I don't have a problem. His walls are up. I can feel them guarding him. Obviously you do. Why did you leave this morning? He runs a hand through his hair. I already told you. Lying to me isn't going to help anything, that's what got you us into this mess in the first place, I remind him. Fine. Do you want to know where I was? I was at my dad's, he shouts and stands up. Your dad's? Why? Talking to Landon. He sits down on the chair. I roll my eyes. I believe the work story more than this. I was. Go on and call him, if you don't believe me. Okay, and what were you talking with Landon about? You, of course. What about me? I raise my hands in front of me. Just everything. I know you don't want to be here. He looks over at me. If I didn't want to be here, I wouldn't be. You have nowhere else to go, I know you wouldn't be here if you did. What makes you so sure? We slept in the bed together last night. Yeah, and you know why, if I hadn't had a nightmare, you wouldn't have agreed to it. That's the only reason you did, and the only reason you're talking to me now. Because you feel sorry for me. His hands are shaking, and his eyes are piercing. I can see the shame behind the green. It doesn't matter why it happened. I shake my head at him. I don't know why he always jumps to these conclusions. Why is it so hard for him to accept that he is loved? Do you feel sorry for poor Hardin who has nightmares and can't sleep in a fucking bed alone? His voice is too loud and we have company. 
Stop yelling. Your mom is in the other room. I yell back. Is that what you two did all day talk about me? I don't need your fucking pity, Tess. Oh my god. You are so frustrating. We did not talk about you, not in that way. And for the record, I do not feel sorry for you, I wanted you in that bed with me regardless of your dreams. I cross my arms. Sure, he barks. This isn't about how I feel, it's about how you feel about yourself. You need to stop feeling sorry for yourself, if anything, I say equally harshly. I don't. Seems like it. You just started a fight with me for no reason. We should be moving forward not backward. Moving forward? His eyes meet mine. Yeah I mean may maybe, I stutter. Maybe? He smiles. And he's so happy all of a sudden, he's grinning like a small child on Christmas. He was just fighting with me, his cheeks flushed in anger. And strangely, I feel most of my anger evaporating as well. The control that he holds over my emotions terrifies me. You are insane, literally, I tell him. He gives me a killer smirk. Your hair looks nice. You need to be medicated, I tease, and he laughs. I wouldn't argue there, he responds. And I can't help but laugh with him maybe I'm just as crazy as he is. Chapter 31. Tessa. Our moment together is interrupted when my phone vibrates and dances across the dresser. Hardin grabs it for me, looks at the screen, and says Landon. Taking the phone from him, I answer, hello? Hey, Tessa, Landon says. So, my mom wanted me to call and see if you were coming over for Christmas. His mom is so nice. And I bet she makes a great Christmas spread. Oh yeah, I'd love to. What time should I be there? I reply. Noon. He laughs. She's already started cooking, so if I were you, I wouldn't eat anything until then. I'll start fasting now, I joke. Anything I should bring? I know Karen's a much better cook than me, but I could make something, dessert, maybe? Yeah, you can bring a dessert, and also I know this is awkward, and if you aren't comfortable with it, then that's okay. His voice lowers. But they want to invite Hardin and his mum. But if you and Hardin aren't getting along, we are. Sort of, I interrupt. Hardin raises his brow at my reply, and I give him a nervous smile. Landon lets out a little breath. Super. If you could just pass the invite along, they would really appreciate it. I will, I assure him, and then something occurs to me. What should I get them, gift-wise? No, no, nothing. You don't have to bring gifts. I keep my eyes on the wall and try not to focus on Hardin's steady gaze on me. Okay, sure. But I'm bringing gifts, so what should it be? Landon sighs good-naturedly. Stubborn as always. Well, my mum likes her kitchen, and Ken would go for a paperweight or something. A paperweight? I snort. That's a dreadful gift. He laughs. Well, don't get him a tie, because I did. Then he groans. Well, let me know, if you need anything between now and then. I have to go help clean the house he says and hangs up. When I put my phone down, Hardin immediately asks, you are going there for Christmas? Yeah I don't want to go to my mother's, I say and sit on the bed. I don't blame you. He rubs his chin with his index finger. You could stay here? I pick up my fingernails on my lap. You could come with me. And leave my mum here alone, he scoffs. No. Of course not, Karen and your dad want her to come both of you. Hardin looks at me like I'm crazy. Yeah, right. And why would my mum want to go there with my father and his new wife? I, I don't know, but it could be nice to have everyone together. Really, though, I'm not sure how exactly that would go, largely because I don't know what type of relationship Trish and Ken have now, if they have one at all. It's also not my place to try to bring everyone together, I'm not part of their family. Heck, I'm not even Hardin's girlfriend. I don't think so. He frowns. Despite everything going on between Hardin and me, it would have been nice to spend Christmas with him, but I understand. It would have been hard enough to convince Hardin to go to his father's house for the holiday anyway, let alone with his mother. Because part of my brain likes a problem to solve, I start thinking that I need to get gifts for Landon and his parents, maybe something for Trish as well. But what? 
I should go now. Really, it's already five, which only leaves a bit tonight, and then tomorrow Christmas Eve. I have no idea whether or not I should get something for Hardin. Actually, I'm pretty sure I shouldn't. It would be awkward to give him a present when we're in this strange in-between place. What is it? Hardin asks of my silence. I groan. I have to go to the mall. This is what I get for being homeless on Christmas, I tell him. I don't think bad planning has anything to do with you being homeless, he teases. His smile is small but his eyes are bright as he flirting with me. I laugh at the thought and roll my eyes. Bad planning is not something that I do, ever. Sure he mocks, and I swat my hand at him. He grabs my wrist and wraps his fingers around it to stop my playful assault. A familiar warmth floods through my body and I lock eyes with him. He lets go quickly, and we both look away. The air fills with tension, and I stand up to put my shoes back on. You're going now? He asks. Yeah, the mall closes at nine, I remind him. You're going alone? He shuffles his feet awkwardly. Would you like to come? I know this probably isn't the best idea, but if I want to at least try to move forward, then going to the mall together is fine. Right? Come shopping with you? Yet if you don't want to, that's fine too, I say awkwardly. No, of course I do. I just wasn't expecting you to ask. I nod, then grab my phone and purse. Hard and close on my heels, I go out into the living room. We're going to the mall for a while, Hardin tells his mom. Both of you, she asks knowingly, and he rolls his eyes. As we hit the door, she yells over her shoulder, Tessa, dear, if you want to leave him there, I won't complain. I chuckle. I'll keep that in mind, I say and follow him out. When Hardin's car starts, a very familiar piano melody fills the air. He hurries to turn the volume down, but it's too late. I give him a smug look. They grew on me, okay, he says. Sure, I tease and turn the song back up. If only things could go this way forever. If only this flirty getting along, this nervous middle ground that we are in could last forever. But it won't. It can't. We have to actually discuss what has happened, and what will happen from here on out. I know we have, so much to talk about, but we aren't going to solve this problem all at once, even if I force the issue. I want to find the right time, and take it slow until then. Most of the drive, is spent in silence, the music saying all of the things I wish we could say to each other. When we near the Macy's entrance, Hardin says, I'll drop you off by the door, and I nod. I stand under the vent, to warm up while he parks, and hurries through the cold to me. After nearly an hour of looking at baking dishes of all shapes and sizes, I decide to get Karen a set of cake pans. I know she probably has more than enough, but cooking and gardening seem to be her only hobbies, and I don't have time to think of anything better. Can we take this to the car, and then finish shopping? I ask Hardin and struggle to keep the large box in my hands. Here, I'll take it. Stay here, he says and takes the box from me. As soon as he walks away, I walk over to the men's section, where hundreds of ties in large cases mockingly remind me of Landon's claim about them as an easy gift. I keep browsing, but I've never bought a dad gift before, so I have no idea what to get. It's so fucking cold out, Hardin says when he returns, shivering and rubbing his hands together. Well, maybe wearing a t-shirt in the snow isn't a good idea. He rolls his eyes. I'm hungry, are you? We make our way to the food court, where Hardin finds me a seat, while he gets us some pizza from the only decent chain there. Minutes later, he joins me at the table with two plates piled full. I grab a slice and a napkin and take a small bite. How elegant of you, he teases when I wipe my mouth after I chew. Shut up, I say and take another. This is nice. Isn't it? He asks. What? The pizza? I innocently ask back, even though I know he isn't talking about the food. Us? Hanging out. It's been a long time. It does seem like so long it hasn't even been two weeks, I remind him. That's a long time for us. Yeah, I take a bigger bite, so I can keep silent a little longer. How long have you been thinking about moving forward, he asks. I slowly finish chewing and take a long drink of my water. A few days, I guess. I want to keep this conversation as light as I can, 
in order to avoid causing a scene, but I do add, there's still so much to talk about. I know there is, but I'm so his green eyes go white as he focuses on something behind me. When I turn around, my stomach drops at the sight of red hair. Steph. And next to her, her boyfriend, Tristan. I want to go, I tell him and stand up, leaving the tray of food on the table. Tessa, you haven't gotten any other gifts. Besides, I don't think they even saw us. When I turn back around, Steph's eyes meets mine, and the surprise on her face is evident. I can't tell if she's more surprised to see me or that I'm with Hardin. Probably both. Yeah, she did. The pair walk over to us, and I feel like my feet are bolted to the floor. Hey, Tristan says uncomfortably when they reach us. Hey, Hardin says and rubs the back of his neck. I don't say anything. I look at Steph, then grab my purse from the table and begin to walk away. Tessa, wait, she calls after me. The thick heels of her shoes smack against the hard tile as she hurries to catch up with me. Can we talk? Talk about what, Steph? I snap. How my first and basically only friend here let me be humiliated in front of everyone. Hardin and Tristan look at each other, obviously unsure whether to intervene. Steph throws out her hands. I'm sorry, okay. I know I should have told you, I thought he would tell you. So that's supposed to make it okay, then? No, I know it won't, but I'm really sorry Tessa. I know I should have told you. But you didn't. I cross my arms. I miss you. I miss hanging out with you, she says. I'm sure you do miss, having me as the focus of all of your jokes. It wasn't like that, Tessa. You are were my friend. I know I fucked up, but I really am sorry. Her apology catches me off guard. But I recover and say, well, I can't forgive you. She frowns. And then her expression turns angry. But you can forgive him? He's the one who started it all, and you forgave him. How fucked up is that? I want to snap at her, cuss her out even, but I know she's right. I haven't forgiven him, I'm just I don't know what I'm doing, I whine and put my hands over my face. Steph's eyes. Tessa, I don't expect you to just let it go like that, but at least, give me a chance. We could hang out, just the four of us. The group is all fucked up, anyway. I look up at her. What do you mean? Well, Jace has been an even bigger dick since Hardin beat the shit out of him. So Tristan and I have been keeping our distance from everyone. I look over to where Hardin and Tristan are watching us, and then look back at Steph. Hardin beat up Jace? Yeah last Saturday. She scrunches her brows. He didn't say anything? No I want to hear as much as I can before Hardin walks over and stops her from spilling, but she's eager to be on my good side. So she starts without my even having to ask. Yeah, well, it's because Molly told Hardin that Jay's planned the whole you know, she adds quietly, telling you in front of everyone but then she laughs a little. Honestly, he had it coming, and the look on Molly's face when Hardin basically pushed her off of him was priceless. I mean, seriously, I should have taken a picture. I'm pondering the fact that Hardin turned down Molly and beat up Jay's. That Saturday before he came to Seattle, when I hear Tristan say, ladies, almost as if in warning that Hardin's near. Hardin joins me and takes my hand, and as Tristan starts to pull Steph away, she stays facing me for a moment and says with wide eyes, Tessa, just think about it, okay? I miss you. Chapter 32. Tessa. You okay? Hardin asks when they disappear. Yeah, I'm fine, I tell him. What did she say? Nothing just that she wants me to forgive her. I shrug, and we head off down the main throughway. I need to process everything that Steph just told me before I bring it up to Hardin. He must have been at one of their parties before he came to Seattle, and Molly must have been there. I can't deny it's a massive relief to hear Steph's take on things. We go to a sporting goods store, and I stay fairly quiet as well, and Hardin chooses a few things for his father. He refuses to let me pay, so I grab a keychain off the display case near the register and pay for it myself just to annoy him. He rolls his eyes and I stick my tongue out at him. You do know that you grabbed the wrong team, right? He says when we exit the store. What? I reach in and grab the small object. 
That's the Giants, not the Packers. He smirks, and I shove the keychain back into the bag. Well good thing no one will know the good gifts are actually from you. Are we done yet? He whines. No, I have to get something for Landon, remember? Oh yeah. He mentioned that he wanted to try a new shade of lipstick. Maybe coral? I put my hands on my hips and face him. Do you leave him alone? And maybe I should be getting you the lipstick, since you seem to know the exact shade, I tease. It feels good to be bickering with Harden in a playful way instead of a let's burn the house down way. He rolls his eyes, but I see a small smile appear before he speaks. You should just get him hockey tickets. Easy and not too expensive. That's actually a good idea. I know, he says. Too bad he doesn't have any friends to go with him. Um, I would go with him. The way Harden is teasing about Landon makes me smile because it is so different than before, there is no malice behind his tone now. I wanted to get your mom something too, I tell him. He gives me a funny little harmless look. Why? Because it's Christmas. Just get her a sweater or something, he says in gestures at a store, meant more for old ladies. Eyeing it, I say, I'm terrible at buying gifts for people. What did you get her? The present he got me for my birthday was so perfect that I imagine the gift he chose for his mother must be equally thoughtful. He shrugs. A bracelet and a scarf. A bracelet? I ask and pull him farther down the mall. No, I meant a necklace anyway. It's just a plain necklace that says mom or some shit. How nice of you, I say as we walk back into Macy's. I look around, feeling confident. I think I can find her something here she likes those tracksuits. Oh god please, no more tracksuits. She wears them every day. I smile at his sour expression. So all the more reason, to buy her another one. As we look at several racks with various options, Hardin reaches out and feels the sheer fabric on one. I get a good look at his knuckles, and the scabs on them, bringing me back to the information staff revealed. I pretty quickly find a mint green tracksuit that I'm sensing she'll like, and we wander off to find the register. En route, a sort of resolve takes over my frantic thoughts about Hardin, partly because I now know he wasn't actually sleeping with Molly while I was in Seattle. As we get to the register and place the outfit on the counter, I suddenly turn to Hardin and say, we need to talk tonight. The cashier looks back and forth between Hardin and me, confusion evident in her eyes. I want to tell her it's rude to stare, but Hardin speaks, before I get the courage. Talk? Yeah I say, and watch the cashier remove the security tag. After we put that tree up, that your mom got when you two went out yesterday. Talk about what, though? I turn to look at him. Everything, I say. Hardin looks terrified in the implications of that word hang heavy in the air. When the cashier scans the tracksuit's tag, a beep breaks the silence, and Hardin mumbles, oh I'll go get the car. As I watch the woman bag Trisha's gift, I think, next year I'll make sure to get everyone amazing gifts to make up for my terrible gifts this year. But then I think, next year? Who says there'll be a next year with him? Both of us stay silent during the ride back to the apartment, me because I'm trying to organize my thoughts about everything I should say, and him well, I get the feeling he's doing the same. When we arrive, I grab the bags and rush through the freezing rain, and into the lobby. I'd take the snow over this any day. When we step into the elevator, my stomach grumbles. I'm hungry, I tell Hardin when he looks down at me. Oh. He looks like he wants to say something sarcastic, but decides against it. The sensation is only heightened when we get inside the apartment, and the smell of garlic takes over my senses, instantly making my mouth water. I made dinner. Trish announces. How was the mall? Hardin grabs the bags from my hands and disappears into the bedroom. It wasn't too bad. Not nearly as crowded as I'd thought it would be, I explain. That's good, I thought maybe you and I could put that tree up? Hardin probably won't want to help. She smiles. He hates fun. But the two of us could do it, if you don't mind? I chuckle. Yeah, of course. You should eat first, Hardin commands as he strides back into the kitchen. I scowl at him, and turn my attention back to Trish. Since my dreaded talk with Hardin, 
is on the other end of my assembling this small tree with his mother, I'm in no particular rush. Besides, I need at least an hour to muster up enough strength to be able to say everything that I want to say. It's probably not the best idea to have such an important talk with his mother here, but I can't wait any longer. Everything that's going to be said needs to be said now. My patience is waning. We can't stay in this in-between place much longer. Are you actually hungry now, Tessa dear? Trish asks me. Yes, she is, Hardin answers for me over his shoulder. Yeah, I actually am, I tell her, ignoring her obnoxious son. While Trish makes me a plate of chicken casserole with spinach and garlic, I sit at the table focusing on how delicious it smells. When she brings the plate over, I see it looks even better than it smells. As she puts the plate in front of me, Trish says, Hardin, you could take the pieces out of the tree out of box for us, make it a little easier? Sure, he says. She smiles at me. I got a few ornaments too. By the time I've finished eating, Hardin has the branches slid into the slots in the tree assembled. That wasn't so bad, was it, his mom says. When he grabs the box of ornaments, she goes over to him. We'll help with those. Completely full, I get up from the table and ponder how putting together a Christmas tree with Hardin and his mother in an apartment that was ours is something I'd have never thought I'd be doing. Ever. I enjoy the feeling while we decorate, and in the end, though the ornaments seem randomly hung on the miniature tree, Trish looks very pleased. We should get a photo in front of it, she suggests. I don't do pictures, Hardin grumbles. Oh, come on, Hardin, it's the holidays. She bats her lashes, and he rolls his eyes at her for the hundredth time since her arrival. Not today, he replies. I know it isn't fair of me, but I feel for his mother, so I look at him with big eyes and say, just one? Fine, fuck. Just one. He stands next to Trish in front of the tree, and I grab my phone to take a picture of them. Hardin barely smiles, but Trish's cheerfulness makes up for it. Still, I'm relieved when she doesn't suggest that Hardin and I take a picture together. We need to figure out what we're doing before we start romantic pictures in front of Christmas trees. I get Trish's phone number and send a copy of the picture to her and Hardin, who walks back to the kitchen and makes himself a plate of food. I'm going to go wrap some gifts before it gets too late, I announce. Okay, see you in the morning, sweetie, Trish says and gives me a hug. Going into the bedroom, I see that Hardin has already gathered the wrapping paper, bows, tape, and everything else I could possibly need. I hurry to start wrapping, so we can have the talk sooner rather than later. I really want to get it over with, but at the same time, I'm afraid of how it will go. I know that I've made up my mind, but I'm not sure if I'm ready to admit it. I know how foolish it is of me, but I've been a fool since I first met Hardin and that hasn't always been a bad thing. I finish writing Ken's name on a gift tag just as he walks in. Done, he asks. Yeah, I need to get those tickets printed for Landon before we talk. He cocks his head back. Why? Because I need your help, and you're not helpful when we're fighting. How do you know we'll fight? He asks. Because it's us. I half laugh, and he silently nods in agreement. I'll get the printer from the closet. As he walks away, I turn on my laptop. Twenty minutes later we have two tickets to the Seattle Thunderbirds printed and wrapped in a small box for Landon. Okay so any other distractions before we you know, talk? Hardin asks. No. I guess not, I reply. We both go and sit on the bed, him against the headboard with his long legs stretched out, me with my legs, tucked under me at the other end. I have no idea where to start or what to say. So Hardin begins. This is awkward. So I pick up my nails. What happened with Jace? I ask. Steph told you, he states flatly. Yeah, she did. He was running his mouth. Hardin, you have to talk to me, or this isn't going to work. His eyes go wide with indignation. I am talking. Hardin okay. Okay. He lets out an angry breath. He was planning to try to hook up with you. My stomach turns at the thought. Plus, that's not the reason for the fight that Steph told me at the mall. Is Hardin lying to me again? So? 
Do you know that would never happen? That doesn't make a difference, even thinking about him touching you, he shudders and continues, and also, he's the one who well. Molly too, who planned to tell you about the bed in front of everyone. He had no fucking right to humiliate you like that. He ruined everything. The momentary relief I feel that heart in story now matches Steph's is quickly replaced by anger over his attitude, that if only I didn't know about the bed, everything would have been fine. Hardin, you ruined it. They just told me about it, I remind him. I know that, Tessa, he says with annoyance. Do you? Do you know that, though? Because you haven't really said anything about it. Hardin pulls his legs back with a sudden move. Yes, I have, I was crying the other day, for fuck's sake. I feel a scowl etch itself into my features. You need to stop cursing at me so much, for one thing. And two, that was one time. That's really the only time you've said anything. And it wasn't much. I tried in Seattle, but you wouldn't talk to me. And you've been ignoring me, so when was I supposed to tell you? Hardin, the point is, if we're going to even try to move past this, I need you to open up to me, I need to know exactly how you feel, I tell him. His green eyes bore into me. And when do I get to hear how you feel, Tessa? You're just as closed off as I am. What? No no, I'm not. Yes, you are. You haven't told me how you feel about any of this. You just keep saying you're done with me. He waves his hands toward me. But here you are. It gets a bit confusing. I need a moment to think about what he just said. I've had so many thoughts jumbled in my head that I've forgotten to communicate any of them to him. I have been so confused, I say. I'm not a mind reader, Tessa. What are you confused about? A lump forms in my throat. This. Us. I don't know what to do. About us. About your betrayal. We've just started this conversation, and I'm already on the verge of tears. A little harshly, he says, what do you want to do? I don't know. He calls me out. Yes, you do. There are a lot of things that I need to hear him say before I can be sure of what I want to do. What do you want me to do? I want you to stay with me. I want you to forgive me and give me another chance. I know I've asked you too many times, but please, just give me one more chance. I can't be without you. I've tried, and I know you have too. There isn't anyone else for either of us. If it's not us, it's nothing, and I know that you know that too. His eyes are glassy when he finishes, and I wipe my tears away. You hurt me, so terribly, Hardin. I know, baby, I know I did. I would give anything to take that back, he says, then looks down at the bed with a strange expression. Actually I wouldn't. I wouldn't change anything. Well, I would have told you sooner, obviously, he says. I snap my head up. He brings his up and stares right into me. I wouldn't take it back, because we wouldn't have been together if I hadn't done such a fucked up thing. Our paths would have never really crossed, not in the way that has bonded us together so tightly. Even though it's destroyed my life, without that stupid, evil bet, I wouldn't have had a life at all. I'm sure that makes you hate me even more, but you wanted the truth. And that's the truth. Looking into Hardin through his green eyes, I don't know what to say. Because when I think about it, really think about it, I know I wouldn't change anything either. Chapter 33. Hardin. I've never been so honest with anyone before. But I want everything to be out on the table. She starts crying and asks softly, how will I know that you won't hurt me again? I could tell she was trying to hold her tears in the whole time, but I'm glad she can't anymore. I needed to see some emotion from her, she's been so cold lately. So I'm like her. I used to be able to tell what she was thinking by her eyes alone. Now a wall is up, blocking me from reading her the way only I can. I pray to God that the time we spend together today will work in my favor. That in my honesty. You won't. Tessa, I can assure you that I will hurt you again. You will hurt me too, but I can also assure you that I'll never keep anything from you or betray you again. You may say some shit that you don't mean, and God knows that I will, but we can work through our problems because that's what people do. I just need this one last chance to show you that I can be the man you deserve. Please, Tessa. Please I beg. 
She stares at me with red eyes, chewing on the inside of her cheek. I hate to see her this way, and I hate myself for making her this way. Do you love me, don't you? I ask, afraid of her answer. Yes. More than anything. She admits with a sigh. I can't hide my stirrings of a smile. Hearing her say that she still loves me brings the life back into me. I've been so worried that she was going to give up on me, stop loving me and move on. I don't deserve her, and I know that she's aware of that. But my mind is reeling, and she is being too quiet. I can't handle the distance. What can I do, then? What do I need to do so we can get through this? I ask desperately. I use too much emphasis I know because of how she looks at me, like she's suddenly scared, or annoyed, or I don't know what. I said the wrong thing, didn't I? I bring my hands to my face and wipe the moisture from my eyes. I knew I would, you know I'm not good with words. I've never been this emotional in my entire life, and it doesn't feel good. I've never had to or even cared to express my emotions to anyone, but I will do anything for this girl. I always fuck everything up, but I have to fix this, or try as hard as I can. No she sobs. I'm just I don't know. I want to be with you. I want to forget everything, but I don't want to regret it. I don't want to be that girl, the one who gets walked all over and treated like shit, and just puts up with it. I lean toward her and ask, to who? Who are you worried will think that? Everyone, my mother, your friends you. I knew that's what it was. I knew that she was more worried about what she should do, rather than what she wants to do. Don't think about anyone else. Who gives a shit what anyone else thinks? For once just consider what you want, what makes you happy? With big, round, beautiful, bloodshot, and crying eyes, she says, you. And my heart leaps. I'm so tired of keeping everything in. I'm exhausted by all of the things I haven't said and wanted to say, she adds. Then don't keep it in anymore, I tell her. Do you make me happy, Harden? But you also make me miserable, angry, and, most of all, you make me insane. That's the point, isn't it? That's why we're so good together, Tess, because we are terrible for each other. She makes me insane too, and angry, but happy. So happy. We are terrible for each other, she says with a small smile. We are, I repeat and return her smile. I love you, though. More than anyone ever could, and I swear I will spend the rest of my life making this up to you, if you just let me. I hope she can hear the rawness in my voice, how badly I want her forgiveness. I need it, I need her like I've never needed anything before, and I know she loves me. She wouldn't be here if she didn't, though I can't believe I just said the rest of my life, that might freak her out. When she doesn't say anything else, my heart breaks. And just before I feel more tears coming, I whisper, I'm so sorry, Tessa I love you so much, she catches me completely off guard when she darts across the space between us, and climbs onto my lap. I bring my hands to her beautiful face, and she takes a deep breath, leaning her cheek into the palm of my hand. She looks up at me. I need it to be on my terms. I won't be able to make it through another heartbreak. Whatever it takes. I just want to be with you, I tell her. We have to take it slow, I shouldn't be doing this at all. If you hurt me again, I'll never forgive you ever, she threatens. I won't. I swear it. I'd rather die than hurt her again. I still can't believe she's giving me another chance. I really have missed you so much, Harden. Her eyes close, and I want to kiss her, I want to feel her lips hot against mine, but she just told me she wants to take it slow. I missed you too. She rests her forehead against mine, and I let out a breath that I didn't know I was holding. We're really doing this, then, I ask, trying not to sound as desperately relieved as I feel. She sits up, and I look into her eyes. The eyes that have haunted me every time I close my own for the last week. She smiles and nods her head. Yeah I guess we are. My arms wrap around her waist, and she leans into me once more. Kiss me? I practically beg. She doesn't try to hide her amusement as she touches my forehead, brushing my hair back. God. I love when she does that. Please? I say. And she silences me, by pressing her lips against mine. Chapter 34. Tessa.
my mouth immediately opens, and he doesn't miss the opportunity to slip his tongue into it. The metal of his lip ring is cool against my lips, and I run my tongue along its smooth surface. The familiar taste of him ignites me, like it always has. No matter how hard I fight it, I need him. I need to be close to him, I need him to comfort me, to challenge me, to annoy me, to kiss me, and to love me. My fingers tangle themselves in his hair, and I tug at the soft strands, when his grip on my waist tightens. He said everything I wanted and needed to hear to feel better about my reckless decision, to allow him back into my life, even though he never actually left. I know I should have held out longer, tortured him with waiting the way he tortured me with his lies, but I couldn't. This isn't the movies. This is real life, my life, and my life isn't complete, or even tolerable without him. This tattooed, rude, angry boy has gotten under my skin, and into my heart, and I know that, no matter how hard I try, I can't get him out. His tongue skims my bottom lip, and I'm slightly embarrassed, when a moan escapes my throat. When I pull away, we're both out of breath and my skin is hot, and his cheeks are flushed. Thank you for giving me another chance, he pants and pulls me into his chest. You act like I had a choice. He frowns. You do. I know, I lie. But I haven't had a choice, since I met him. I've been completely gone for him since the first time we kissed. Where do we go from here? I ask him. That's up to you. You know what I want. I want to be like we were before well, how we were without all the other stuff, I tell Hardin, and he nods. That's what I want too, baby. I'll make this up to you, I promise. Every time Hardin calls me baby my stomach flutters. The mixture of his raspy voice, his British accent, and the gentleness behind his tone makes for the most perfect combination. Please don't make me regret this, I beg him, and he takes my face into his hands once more. I won't. You'll see, he promises and kisses me again. I know that Hardin and I still have things to sort out, but I feel so resolved now, so calm, so right. I'm worried about everyone's reaction, especially my mother's, but I'll deal with that when the time comes. The fact that I'm not spending Christmas with her for the first time in 18 years in favor of Hardin and me being together again will only make things worse, but honestly I don't care. Well, I care, but I can't keep going to war with her over my life choices, and it's impossible to make her happy, so I'm done really trying. I lean my head against Hardin's chest, and he takes the end of my ponytail into his hands, and twirls it between his fingers. I'm glad that I got all of the gifts wrapped. It was stressful enough buying them at the very last minute. Shit. I didn't get Hardin a gift. Did he get me one? Probably not, but now that we're together again, or sort of for the first time I'm afraid that he did and will feel bad that I didn't get him anything at all. Actually, what would I even get him? What's wrong, he asks and moves his hand to my chin, tilting my face to his. Nothing you aren't he starts, slow and unsure. You're not you know changing your mind? No no. I just I didn't get you a gift, I admit. His face breaks into a smile, and his eyes meet mine. You're worried about getting me a gift for Christmas? He laughs. Tessa, honestly, you've given me everything. You worrying about a Christmas gift is ridiculous. I still feel guilty, but I love the confidence on his face. You're sure? I ask. Positive. He laughs again. I'll get you something really great for your birthday, I say, and he moves his hand back to my face. His thumb runs along my bottom lip, causing my lips to part, and I expect him to kiss me again. Instead, his lips touch down on my nose, and then my forehead in a surprisingly sweet gesture. I don't really do birthdays, he tells me. I know I don't either. This is one of the few things we have in common. Harden? Trisha's voice calls as I hear a light tap on the door. He groans and rolls his eyes as I climb off his lap. I give him a little frown. It wouldn't kill you to be nicer to her she hasn't seen you in a year. I'm not mean to her, he says. And, honestly, I know he believes that. Just try to be a little nicer, for me. I bat my eyelashes dramatically, making him smile and shake his head. You the devil he teases. His mom knocks again. Harden? Coming. He says and climbs off the bed. Opening the door, I see his mom, 
who looks completely bored. Do you two want to watch a movie, perhaps? She asks. He turns to me and raises his brow just as I say, yeah, we do and climb off the bed. Fantastic. She smiles and ruffles her son's hair. Let me change first Harden says and waves us out. Trish holds her hand out to me. Come on, Tessa, let's make some snacks. As I follow his mom into the kitchen, I realize it's probably not a good idea for me to watch Harden change anyway. I want to take things slow. Slow. With Harden, I don't know if that's possible. I wonder if I should tell Trish that I've decided to forgive him, or at least try to. Cookies, she asks, and I nod, and open the cabinets. Peanut butter? I ask her, and grab the flour. She raises her eyebrows, impressed. You're going to make them? I was okay with break and bake, but if you can make them homemade, so much the better. I'm not the best cook, but Karen taught me an easy peanut butter cookie recipe. Karen, she asks, and my stomach drops. I didn't mean to bring up Karen. The last thing I want to do is make Trish uncomfortable. I turn away to turn on the oven and hide my embarrassed expression. You've met her? I can't read her tone, so I tread carefully. Yeah, her son Landon is my friend, my best friend, really. Trish hands me some bowls and a spoon, asking in a purposely neutral manner, oh, what is she like? I level off flour in a measuring cup and add it to the large mixing bowl, all the while trying to avoid eye contact. I don't know how to answer her. I don't want to lie, but I don't know how she feels about Kenner, his new wife. You can tell me, Trish prods. She's lovely, I admit. She nods sharply. I knew she would be. I didn't mean to bring her up, it just slipped out, I apologize. She hands me a stick of butter. No, honey, don't worry about it. I have no hard feelings toward that woman at all. Granted, I would love to hear that she's a dreadful troll. She laughs and relief washes through me. But I'm glad Hardin's father is happy. I just wish Hardin would let go of his anger toward him. He has, I begin but stop abruptly when Hardin enters the kitchen. He has what, she asks. I look to Hardin, then back to Trish. It's not my place to tell her if Hardin hasn't. What are you guys talking about, he asks. Dear father, she answers, and his face pales. I can tell by his expression that he didn't intend to tell her about his budding relationship with his father. I didn't know I'd try to tell him, but he puts his hand up to silence me. I hate how secretive he is, this is a problem we will always have, I assume. It's fine, Tess. I've been sort of spending a little time with him. Hardin's cheeks flush. Without thinking, I walk over to stand next to him. I'd expected him to be angry with me and lie to his mother, but I'm glad that he proved me wrong. You have? Trish gasps. Yeah, I'm sorry, Mum. I didn't go near him until a few months ago, I got drunk and trashed his living room. But then I stayed the night a few times, and we went to the wedding. You've been drinking again? Her eyes begin to water. Hardin, please tell me you haven't been drinking again? No, Mom, only a couple times. Not like before he promises. But sometimes you have to choose to let things go, to move on. I really am happy that you've been seeing him. It's good for you. The reason I send you here well, one of the reasons, was for you to forgive him. I didn't forgive him. You should, she says sincerely. I have. Hardin leans on his elbows on the counter and drops his head, while I rub my hand up and down his back. Noticing the gesture, Trish gives me a knowing smile. Even more than before, I admire her so much. She's so strong and loving despite the lack of emotion from her son. I wish he had someone in her life, the way Ken has Karen. Hardin must have been thinking the exact same thing because he drops his head and says, but he lives in this big ass house and has expensive cars. He has a new wife and you're alone. I don't care about his house or his money, she assures him. Then she smiles. And what makes you think I'm alone? What? He raises his head. Don't sound so surprised. I'm quite the catch, son. You're seeing someone? Who? Mike. She blushes and my heart warms. Hardin's mouth gapes. Mike? Your neighbor? Yes, my neighbor. He's a very nice man, Hardin. 
She laughs and looks at me knowingly. And it's convenient having him live just next door. Hardin waves that off. For how long? Why didn't you tell me? A few months, it's nothing serious yet. Besides, I don't think I should be asking you for relationship advice, she teases. Mike, though? He's sort of a don't you say a bad word about him. You're not too old for a spanking, she scolds with a wry grin. He raises his arms playfully. Fine fine he's much more relaxed than he was this morning. The tension between us has disappeared, mostly, and watching him joke with his mother makes me so happy. Trish announces cheerfully, excellent. I'm going to go pick the movie, don't come in there, unless you bring cookies. She smiles and leaves us alone in the kitchen. I walk back over to the bowl of ingredients and finish mixing the cookie dough. When I lick a glob of it off my finger, Hardin oh so helpfully notes, I don't think that's very sanitary. I dip my finger back into the bowl, collecting the sticky dough and walk over to him. Have some, I tell him. I hold up my hand and try to transfer the dough to his fingers, but he opens his mouth and wraps his lips around my finger. I gasp at the contact and try to convince myself this is just his method of removing the cookie dough, regardless of how he's looking at me with dark eyes. No matter how he's flicking his warm tongue over my finger. No matter how many degrees the temperature of the kitchen has seemed to have risen. No matter how my heart is beating out of my chest and my insides are igniting. I think that's enough I croak and pull my finger from his mouth. He gives me a wicked smirk. Later, then. The plate of cookies is devoured within the first 10 minutes of the movie. I have to admit I'm proud of my newly acquired baking skills. Trish praises me, and Hardin eats over half of the batch, which is praise in and of itself. Is it bad that these cookies are my favorite thing about America so far? Trish laughs as she takes the last bite. Yes, very sad, Hardin teases her, and I giggle. You may have to make these every day until I leave, Tessa. Sounds good to me. I smile and lean into Hardin. One of his arms snakes behind me at my waist, and I fold my legs up, so I can move even closer to him. Trish falls asleep toward the end of the movie, and Hardin turns the volume down a bit, so we can finish without waking her. By the end, I'm a sobbing mess and Hardin doesn't try to hide his humor at my despair. That was one of the saddest movies I've seen in my entire life. I have no idea how Trish fell asleep. That was terrible, amazing but terribly sad, I sob. Blame my mum. I requested a comedy, yet somehow we ended up with the green mile. I warned you. He moves his arm to my shoulder, pulling me closer and placing a gentle kiss on my forehead. We can turn on friends, when we get to the room, to get your mind off of him die, Harden. Don't remind me. I groan. But he just chuckles before standing up off of the couch and pulling me by the arm to join him. When we get to the room, Hardin switches on the lamp and then the television. When he goes over and locks the door, then turns to me with those bright green eyes and evil dimples, my insides quiver. Chapter 35. Hardin. I'm going to change, Tessa tells me, and disappears into the closet, tissue still in hand. Her eyes are red from her breakdown during the movie. I knew it would upset her, though I have to admit that I was looking forward to her reaction. Not because I want her to be upset, but because I love how emotionally invested she becomes in things. She opens herself so fully to these fictional forces, whether in a movie or a novel, that she allows them to completely pull her in. It's captivating to watch. She emerges from the closet in only shorts and her white lace bra. Holy shit. I don't even try to be subtle with my staring. Do you think you could wear you know, my shirt? I ask her. I'm not sure how she'll feel about that, but I miss seeing her wearing my shirts to bed. I would love to. She smiles and pulls my used shirt off the top of the clothes hamper. Good, I state, trying not to seem too excited. But I watch the way her breasts spill out of the top of the lace as she lifts her arms. Stop staring. Slow, she wants to go slow. I can go slow slowly in and out of her. Jesus. What the fuck is wrong with me? Just when I consider looking away, she reaches under the shirt and pulls her bra through one sleeve Christ. Something wrong? She asks and climbs onto the bed. No. I gulp and watch in awe as she pulls her hair out of the ponytail it was in. 
As it falls onto her shoulders in beautiful blonde waves, she shakes her head slowly. She has got to be doing this on purpose. Okay she says, and lies on top of the duvet. I wish he would get under it, so she wouldn't look so exposed. She gives me a quizzical look. Are you coming to bed? I hadn't realized that I was still standing by the door. Yeah I know this is a little strange right now, you know, getting used to being together again, but you don't have to be so distant, she says nervously. I know, I respond and join her on the bed, holding my hands low and in front of me to hide things. It's really not as strange as I thought it would be, she says in an ear whisper. Yeah I'm relieved to hear that, I was worried that it wouldn't be the same as before. That she would be guarded, and not the Tess, that I love so much. It's only been a few hours, but I hope things stay this way. It's so easy with her, so damn easy, yet difficult at the same time. She lays a small hand on mine, and leans onto my chest you are being so weird. Tell me what's on your mind, she requests. I'm just glad you're still here, that's all. And I can't stop thinking about making love to you, I add silently. It's not just about getting off with Tessa like it always was before, it's much more. So much more. It's about being as connected and tied to her as I possibly can be. It's about her trusting me fully. My chest aches when I think about the trust she had for me, but that I shattered. That's not all, she says, calling me out. I shake my head in agreement, and she draws a line against my temple and down to the metal in my eyebrow with one finger. It's terrible what I'm thinking, I admit. I don't want her to think that she's an object to me, that I just want to use her. I really don't want to tell her what's on my mind, but I can't continue to keep things from her, I need to be honest with her now and always. As she looks down at me, her worried expression pains me. Tell me. I well, I was thinking about fucking I mean making love to you. Oh, she says softly, her eyes wide. I know, I'm a dick, I groan, wishing I would have just lied. No no you're not. Her cheeks color red. I was sort of thinking about the same thing. She takes her bottom lip between her teeth, taunting me further. You were? Yeah I mean it has been a while well, not including Seattle, during which I was belligerently drunk. I search her face for the judgment she's made about my lack of control when she came onto me last weekend, but there's none there. I see the embarrassment as she recalls the events in her mind. My boxers are growing uncomfortably tight as I remember them too. I don't want you to think that I'm using you because of everything, I explain. Harden, out of all the things I'm thinking right now, that isn't one of them. Granted, it probably should be, but it's not. I was afraid, so afraid that our intimate moments would be forever tainted by my foolishness. You're sure? Because I don't want to fuck up again, I say. She answers me by taking my hand and placing it in between her thighs. Fuck. I grab her waist with my other hand, and pull her toward me. Within seconds I'm hovering over her, one knee between her legs. I kiss her neck first, my mouth feverish and quick against her soft skin. She tugs my t-shirt up, and lifts her back enough for me to pull it off. My tongue leaves a wet trail behind as I kiss over her collarbone, and the swell of her breasts. Her hands pull up my shirt and my sweat simultaneously, and I help her, leaving me in only my boxers. I want to touch every part of her body, every inch of skin, every curve, every angle. God, she is beautiful. As I lower myself to kiss her stomach, her fingers disappear into my hair, tugging at the roots. I nip at her skin. Her panties and shorts are tossed to the floor. My tongue caresses the skin over her hips. I explore her body, as if it's the first or last time, but she rushes me along with a heart and please I bring my mouth to her most sensitive area and slide my tongue across her slowly, savoring her taste as it consumes my senses. Oh God, she pants and pulls harder on my hair. Her hips buck up off of the bed and she presses herself against my tongue. I pull back and she whines. I love that she's as desperate for me as I am for her. I quickly lean up and open the drawer on the nightstand, grabbing the foil packet and tear it open with my teeth. She watches me, and I watch her. I watch the way her chest rises and falls in anticipation. I push down my boxers and lean over to plant a small kiss on her cheek, my cock resting on her thigh for a couple of heartbeats. I straighten up and put the condom on. Stay still, I instruct. 
she obliges and I climb back between her legs. The anticipation is exhilarating. I'm so hard that it hurts. You're always so ready for me, baby, I muse, collecting her moisture on my fingers, before bringing them to her mouth to have her taste. She's shy but doesn't protest as she wraps her tongue around my finger. The sensation causes me to ease into her. The feeling is exquisite, and one I have missed so, so much. Christ, I curse as she moans in relief. All of my previous heartache dissolves as I bury myself into her, filling her up completely. Her eyes roll back in her head, and I deliberately circle my hips slowly, before pulling out and pushing back and repeatedly. More please, harden. Fuck, I love to hear her beg. No, baby I want to go slow this time. I rotate my hips again. I want to savor every second of this. I want it to be slow, and I want her to feel how much I love her, how sorry I am for hurting her, and how I'm willing to do anything for her. I bring my mouth to hers, and caress her tongue with mine. I groan when her fingernails dig into my biceps with a force sure to leave crescent marks in their wake. I love you, I love you so much, I tell her, and increase my pace slightly. I know I'm torturing her with my teasing, slow movements. I, I love you, she moans, and her legs begin to shake, telling me she's almost there. I would love to see what we look like in this moment, molded together yet so separated. The contrast of her smooth, clear skin in the black ink covering mine as she runs her hands up and down my arms, must be quite the sight. It's dark meets light. It's chaotic perfection. It's everything I fear, want, and need. Her moans become louder, and I bring my hand to her mouth, so she can bite on it. SHHH let go, baby. My thrusts quicken as her soft body goes rigid under mine, and she calls my name into my hand. Within seconds I'm joining her, getting high off her. She's the perfect rug. Look at me, I breathe. Her eyes meet mine, and I'm done for. I spill out all of me, and her body relaxes, leaving us both a panting mess. I roll off the condom, and toss it into the bin next to the bed. When I move to climb off, she grabs my arms to stop me. I smile down at her and stay still. I use my elbow to prop me up and keep most of my weight off of her. Tessa's hand touches my cheek, she uses the pad of her thumb to draw small circles against my damp skin. I love you, Hardin, she says quietly. I love you, Tess, I respond and lay my head against her chest. My eyes are heavy as I feel her breathing slow, and I fall asleep listening to the steady thrum of her heartbeat. Chapter 36. Tessa. Hardin's head is heavy on my stomach when the sound of my phone vibrating on the table wakes me up. I lift him gently, as gently as I can, and retrieve the annoying object. The screen flashes with my mother's name, and I groan before answering it. Teresa? My mother chimes through the receiver. Yes. Where are you, and what time will you be here? She asks. I'm not coming there I tell her. It's Christmas Eve, Tessa, I know you are upset over this thing with your father, but you need to spend Christmas with me. You shouldn't be at some hotel alone. I do feel slightly guilty for not spending the holidays with my mother. She isn't the nicest woman, but I'm all she has. Still, I say, I'm not arriving all the way there, mother. It's snowing out, and I don't want to be there. Hardin stirs and lifts his head. Just as I'm about to tell him not to speak, he opens his mouth. What's wrong, he says, and I hear my mother gasp. Teresa Young. What are you thinking, she shouts. Mother, I'm not doing this right now. That's him, isn't it? I know that voice. This is a terrible way to wake up. I move hard and off me and sit up, covering my naked body with a blanket. I am getting off the phone now, mother. Don't you dare hang, but I do hang up. And then put my phone on silent. I knew she would find out sooner or later. I was just hoping it would be later. Well, she knows we're back to doing us. She heard you, and now she's freaking out, I say and hold my phone up to him to show the two calls from her in the past minute. He curls around behind me. You knew she would, so really it's almost better that she found out this way. Not really. I could have told her instead of her just hearing you in the background. He shrugs. It's the same thing. She would have been mad either way. Still. 
I'm slightly annoyed by his reaction. I know he doesn't care for her, but she's still my mother, and I didn't want her to find out like this. You could be a little nicer about the whole thing. He nods and says, sorry. I expected him to have a rude comeback, so that was a pleasant surprise. Hardin smiles and pulls me back down to him. Would you like me to make you some breakfast, Daisy? Daisy? I raise my eyebrow. It's early, and I'm not at my best to quote literature, but you're grumpy, so I called you Daisy. Daisy Buchanan wasn't grumpy. And neither am I. I harumph, but can't help smiling. He laughs. Yes, you are. And how do you know which Daisy I'm talking about? There are only a few, and I know you well enough. Is that so? Yes, and your attempt at insulting me failed miserably, I tease. Yeah yeah Mrs. Bennett, he fires back. I assume that since you said Mrs., you are talking about the mother, not Elizabeth, which means you are trying to call me obnoxious. Then again, you have been off this morning, so maybe you're saying I'm charming? I just don't know with you anymore. I smile. All right all right Christ. He laughs. A man makes one bad joke around here and he's condemned. My earlier irritation dissolves as we continue our banter and climb out of bed. Hardin says to stay in pajamas, since we aren't leaving the house. It's a strange idea to me, though. If I were at my mother's house, I would be expected to be dressed in my Sunday best. You could just wear that shirt. He points to his t-shirt on the floor. I smile and pick it up, pulling it over me, and putting on sweet pants. I don't remember hanging out with Noah in sweats, ever. I didn't wear much makeup until recently, but I was always dressed nicely. I wonder what Noah would have thought if I'd shown up to spend time with him dressed like this. It's funny, I always thought I was comfortable around Noah, thought I was myself around him, because he knew me for so long, when in reality he doesn't know me at all. He doesn't know the real me, the me that Hardin has made me comfortable enough to show. Ready? Hardin asks. I nod and pull my hair back into a messy bun. I switch my phone off and leave it on the dresser, then follow Hardin out into the living room. The delicious scent of coffee fills the apartment, and we find Trish standing in front of the stove flipping pancakes. She smiles and turns to us. Merry Christmas. It's not Christmas, Hardin says, and I shoot him a glare. He rolls his eyes, then smiles at his mother. I pour myself a cup of coffee and thank Trish for making breakfast. Hardin and I sit at the table while she tells us the story of how her grandmother taught her how to make this type of pancakes. Hardin listens intently and even smiles a little. As we start to eat our breakfast of delicious raspberry pancakes, Trish asks, are we going to be opening gifts today? Since I assume you'll be at your mum's tomorrow? I don't know how to answer her exactly and I start to fumble for words. I am actually I am I told, she's going to dad's house tomorrow. She promised Landon that she would, and she's really the only friend he's got, so she can't cancel, Hardin interjects. I'm thankful for the assist, but calling me Landon's only friend is kind of mean well, maybe I am. But he's my only friend as well. Oh that's fine. Honey, you don't need to be afraid to tell me things like that. I have no problem with you spending time with Ken, Trish says, and I can't tell which one of us she's speaking to. Hardin shakes his head. I'm not going. I told Tessa to tell them we said no. Trish stops mid-bite. We? They invited me? Her voice is full of surprise. Yeah they wanted both of you to come, I explain. Why, she asks. I don't know I say. Honestly, I don't. Karen is so kind and I know she really wants to mend what is broken between her husband and his son, so that's the only explanation I have. I already said no. Don't worry about it, mum. Trish finishes her forkful and chews thoughtfully. No, maybe we should go, she says at last, surprising both me and Hardin. Why would you want to go there? Hardin asks and scowls. I don't know the last time I saw your father was almost ten years ago. I think I owe it to myself and to him to see how he's turned his life around. Also, I know you don't want to be away from Tessa for Christmas. I could stay here, I say. I don't want to cancel on them, but I don't want Trish to feel like she has to go. No, 
Really? It's fine. We should go, all of us. You're sure? The worry in Hardin's voice is evident. Yet it won't be so bad. She smiles. Besides, if Kathy taught Tessa how to make those cookies, imagine how good the food will be. Karen, mum, her name's Karen. Hey, she's my ex-husband's new wife, who I'm spending Christmas with. I can call her whatever I want. She laughs and I join her. I'll tell Landon we're all coming, I say and go to grab my phone. I'd never have imagined that my Christmas would be spent with Hardin and his family, both sides of his family. The last few months have been anything but what I expected. When I turn on my phone I have three voicemails, from my mother, I'm sure. I ignore them and dial Landon. Hey, Tessa, Merry Christmas Eve, he greets me, cheery as ever. I can picture his warm smile. Merry Christmas Eve, Landon. Thanks. First things first, you're not calling to bail, are you? No, of course not. Quite the opposite, actually. I was calling to make sure it was still okay if Hardin and Trish came over tomorrow. Really? They want to? Yeah, does this mean you and Hardin? Yeah, I know I'm an idiot. I didn't say that, he says. I know, but you're thinking it, no. I am not. We can talk about it tomorrow, but you aren't an idiot, Tessa. Thank you, I tell him and mean it. He's the only person who won't have a negative opinion on the subject. I'll tell my mom they're coming. She'll be thrilled, he says before we hang up. When I join Hardin and Trish back in the living room, they already have their presents on their laps, and there are two boxes on the couch that I assume are for me. Me first. Trish says and tears the snowflake printed paper off of a box. Her smile is huge as she takes out the tracksuit I got her. I love these. How did you know? She points to the gray one she's wearing. I'm not very good at buying gifts, I tell her. She giggles. Don't be silly, it's lovely, she assures me, while opening the second box. After she has a moment to see what's inside, she squeezes hard and tight, and then holds up a necklace that says mom just like he told me. She seems to like the thick scarf he bought her as well. I really wish I'd gotten hard in something. I knew all along that I would go back to him, and I think he knew it too. He hasn't mentioned that he got me one, and both of the boxes on my lap say they're from Trish, so that's a huge relief. Hardin is next, and he gives his mother his best fake smile when he opens the clothes she bought him. One piece is a red long-sleeved shirt, I try to picture Hardin wearing anything other than black and white, but I can't. Your turn, he says to me. I smile nervously and pull the sparkly bow off of the first gift. Clearly, Trish is better at choosing women's clothing than men's. The pastel yellow dress in the box proves it. It's a light baby doll style, and I love it. Thank you, it's beautiful, I say and give her a hug. I really appreciate her thinking of me. She just met me but she's been so loving and welcoming that I feel as if I've known her much longer. The second box is much smaller than the first, but the amount of tape used to wrap it makes it very difficult to open. When I finally tear through the packaging, I find a bracelet, a sort of charm bracelet unlike anything I've seen before. Trish is so thoughtful, just like her son. I lift it up and run my fingers along the rope textured string to look at the charms. There are only three, each bigger than my thumbnail, two made from what looks like pewter, the other solid white porcelain, maybe? The white charm is an infinity symbol, the ends shaped like hearts. Just like the tattoo on Hardin's wrist. I glance up at him, my eyes moving immediately to his tattoo. He shifts and I look back to the bracelet. The second charm is a music note, and the third, slightly larger than the other two, is in the shape of a book. When I turn the book charm in my fingers, I notice something written on the back. It says, whatever our souls are made of, his and mine are the same. I look up at Hardin and swallow the tears threatening to form. His mother didn't get me this. He did. Chapter 37. Tessa. Hardin's cheeks are flushed. His lips hold a nervous smile as I stare at him quietly for a minute. Then I practically jump over to where he sits on the easy chair. I nearly tackle him with my enthusiasm and my desire just to be close to this wild crazy boy. Luckily, he's strong enough to keep us both from falling over. 
I hug him as tight as I can manage, causing him to cough, so I loosen my grip. It's so it's just perfect, I sob. Thank you. It's so thoughtful, and just unbelievable. I press my forehead against his as I nestle into his lap. It's nothing really, he timidly states, and I wonder at his casual tone, until Trish clears her throat from where she sits nearby. I hurry off his lap. For a moment I forgot that we are not alone in the apartment. Sorry. I tell her and move back to my spot on the couch. She gives me a knowing smile. Don't apologize, dear. Hardin stays quiet. I know he won't talk about the gift in front of Trish, so I change the subject for now. His gift was so incredibly thoughtful. He couldn't have picked a more perfect quote from any novel to engrave on that charm. Whatever our souls are made of, his and mine are the same, it's so perfect for the way I feel about him. We are so different, yet we're exactly the same, just like Catherine and Heathcliff. I can only hope that we don't share the same fate as them. I would like to think that we've learned from their mistakes, somehow, and that we won't allow that to happen. I slide the bracelet over my wrist and slowly rock my lower arm back and forth, letting the charm sway. I've never received anything like this before. I thought the Year Eater was the best gift ever, but Hardin managed to outdo himself by giving me this bracelet. Noah always gave me the same thing, perfume and socks. Every single year. Then again, I gave him cologne and socks each year. That was our thing, our boring, routine thing. I stare at the bracelet for a few more seconds before I realize that both Hardin and Trish are watching me. Immediately I get up and begin to clean the small mess of wrapping paper. With a chuckle, Trish asks, well, lady and gent, what shall we do for the rest of the day? I feel like taking a nap, Hardin tells her, and she rolls her eyes. A nap? This early? And on Christmas, she mocks. It's not Christmas, for the tenth time, he says a bit harshly, but then smiles. You're obnoxious, she scolds and swats at his arm. Like mother, like son. As they gently bicker, I get lost in thought and take the small pile of crinkled and torn paper and push it into the steel trash can. I feel even worse about not getting hard in a gift than I did before. I wish the mall were open today I have no idea what. I'd get, but anything would be better than nothing. I look down at the bracelet again and run my finger over the infinity heart charm. I still can't believe that he would get me a charm to match his tattoo. Almost done? I jump in surprise from the sound and the tickle at my ear. Then I turn and smack Hardin. You scared me. Sorry, love, he says between chuckles. My heart leaps when he calls me love. It's so unlike him. I feel him smile against my neck and he wraps his arms around my waist. Join me for my nap? I turn and face him. No. I'll keep your mom company. But, I add with a smile, I will tuck you in. I don't really like to take naps, unless I'm too exhausted to do anything else, and it would be nice to hang out with his mom and read her something. Hardin rolls his eyes, but leads me to our bedroom. He pulls his shirt over his head, and it falls to the floor. As my eyes travel over the familiar designs inked into his skin, he smiles at me. Do you really like the bracelet? He asks as he walks over to the bed. He tosses the decorative pillows onto the floor and I pick them up. You're so messy. I complain. I put the pillows into the trunk and Hardin's shirt on the dresser before grabbing my e-reader and joining him by the bed. But to answer your question, I do love the bracelet. It's really thoughtful, Hardin. Why didn't you say it was from you? He pulls me down and lays my head on his chest because I knew you were already feeling bad about not getting me something. He lets out a laugh. And you would feel even worse after my amazing gift. Wow, so humble, I tease. Also, when I had it made for you, I had no idea if you would ever speak to me again, he admits. You knew I would. Honestly, I didn't. You were different this time. How so? I look up at him. I don't know you just were. It wasn't like the other hundred times you said you wanted nothing to do with me. Hardin's voice is light as he pushes my loose hair from my forehead with his thumb. I concentrate on the rise and fall of his chest. Well, I knew I mean, I didn't want to admit it, but I knew I would come back. I always do. 
I won't give you reason to leave again. I hope not, I say and kiss the palm of his hand. Me too. I don't say anything else, there's nothing to say at the moment. He's sleepy, and I don't want to talk about me leaving him any longer. Within minutes he's asleep, breathing heavily. Harding calling me Daisy this morning made me want to reread The Great Gatsby, so I scroll through my e-reader's library to see if Harding already loaded it on there. And find that, of course, he has. Just as I'm about to get up and join his mother, I hear a woman's angry voice. Excuse me. My mother. I toss my e-reader to the end of the bed and get up. Why the hell is he here? You have no right to go in there. I hear Trish yell. Trish. My mother. Harden. This apartment. Oh my lord. This isn't going to go well. The bedroom door crashes open to reveal my mother, looking sophisticated yet menacing in a red dress and black heels. Her hair is curled and pinned up to resemble a beehive, and her red lipstick is bright, too bright. How could you be here? After everything, she yells. Mother I begin as she turns to Trish. And who the hell are you, she asks, their faces close together. I'm his mother, Trish says sternly. Hardin groans in his slumber and opens his eyes. What the fuck, are the first words out of his mouth, when he spots the devil in the crimson dress. My mother snaps her head back in my direction. Let's go Teresa. I'm not going anywhere. Why are you even here? I ask her, and she huffs, putting her hands on her hips. Because I have already told you. You are my only child, and I will not sit back and watch you ruin your life over this this asshole. Her words light a fire under my skin, and I immediately go on defense. Do not speak of him that way. I shout. That asshole is my son, Missy, Trish says with hooded eyes. Underneath her humor, is a woman clearly ready to go into the ring for her son. Well, your son is ruining and corrupting my daughter, my mother fires back. Both of you, get out, Hardin says and stands up from the bed. My mother shakes her head and gives a toothy smile. Teresa, grab your things, now. Being ordered about makes me snap, what part of I am not leaving do you not understand? I gave you the opportunity to spend the holidays with me, but you couldn't get over yourself long enough to allow it. I know I shouldn't be speaking to her this way, but I can't help it. Get over myself? Do you think just because you bought a few slutty dresses and learned to put on makeup, you suddenly know more than I do about life? Although she's yelling, it's like she's laughing too. Like my choices are a joke. Well, you're wrong. Just because you gave yourself to this this filth doesn't mean you're a woman. You are nothing but a little girl. A naive, impressionable little girl. Now grab your things, before I do it for you. You will not touch her things, Hardin spits. She isn't going anywhere with you. She's staying here with me, where she belongs. My mother wheels toward him, all humor gone. Where she belongs. Where did she belong when she was staying in a damned motel, because of what you did to her? You are no good for her, and she will not stay here with you. Mrs. White, these two are adults, Trish interjects. Tessa is an adult. If he wants to stay, there is nothing, my mother's enraged eyes turn to meet Trish's equally hard and glare. This is a disaster. I open my mouth to speak, but my mother beats me to it. How can you defend this sinful behavior? After what he did to her, he should be locked away, she screams. She has obviously chosen to forgive him. You need to accept that, Trish says coolly. Too coolly. She looks like a snake, one that slithers by so slowly you never see its attack coming. But when it does, you are done for. My mother is the prey, and right now I can't help but hope that Trish's bite is venomous. Forgive him? He stole her innocence as a game, a bet with his friends and then brag about it, while she was here playing house. Trisha's gasp overrides all sound in the air, and silences everything for a second. Mouth agape, she looks at her son. What oh, you didn't know. You mean, surprise, the liar lied even to his own mother? Poor woman, no wonder you're defending him, my mother says, shaking her head. Your son bet his friends, for money, that he could take Tess's virginity. He even kept the evidence, and flaunted it around the entire campus. I'm frozen. I keep my eyes on our mothers, too afraid to look at Hardin. 
I can tell by the shift in his breathing that he hadn't thought I'd told my mother the details of his deceit. As for his mother, I didn't want her to know the terrible things her son has done. It was my embarrassment to share or not share with people. Evidence? Trisha's voice is shaky. Yes, evidence. The condom. Oh, and the sheets with Tess's stolen virginity on them. God knows what he did with the money, but he was telling everyone every detail of their intimacy. So now you tell me if I should make my daughter come with me or not. My mother raises her perfectly sculpted eyebrow to Trish. I feel at the moment it happens. I feel the change in the room, the energy shifting. Trish is now on my mother's side of this. I try desperately to cling to the edge of the crumbling cliff that is Harden, but I can see it all perfectly in the disgusted glare she gives her son. A look I can tell is nothing new. It's something she's had to use on him before, like a memory brought back as a facial expression. A look that all but says she believes, once again, every bad thing anyone's ever said about her son. How could you, Harden, she cries. I had hoped you were different now I hope you had stopped doing things like this to girls women. Have you forgotten what happened last time? Chapter 38. Tessa. It doesn't help. It doesn't help at all that my mother follows Trish into the living room and practically howls, last time? See, Teresa. This is exactly why you need to get away from him. He has done this before, I knew it. Prince Charming strikes again. I look over at Hardin, my fingers slipping from the edge. Not again. I don't think I can take any more. Not from him. It's not like that, Mum. Hardin finally says. Trish gives him a look of utter disbelief and wipes under her eyes, even as her tears keep coming. It sure sounds like it, Hardin. I honestly can't believe you. I love you, son, but I can't help you here. This is wrong, so wrong. I never am able to find my voice in these situations. I want to speak, I need to, but an endless list of potential terrible things that Trish could be referring to as last time are running rapidly through my head stealing my voice. I said it's not like that. Hardin shouts, his arms out wide. Trish turns and stares at me, hard. Tessa, you should go with your mother, she says, and a lump rises in my throat. What? Hardin says to her. You're no good for her, Hardin. I love you more than life itself, but I can't allow you to do this again. Coming to America was supposed to have helped you, Teresa, my mother says. I think we've have heard enough. She grabs hold of my arm. It's time to go. Harding moves toward her, and she steps back, gripping me tighter. Let go of her, now, he says through gritted teeth. Her plum nails dig into my skin as I try to process the events of the last two minutes. I had not expected my mother to barge into the apartment, and I certainly didn't expect Trish to drop hints about yet another one of Hardin's secrets. Has he done this before? To who? Did he love her? Did she love him? He said he had never been with a virgin before, he said he had never loved anyone before. Was he lying? The angry mask he wears makes it hard for me to decipher. You don't get to have a say in anything that concerns her any longer, my mother strikes back. But, surprising everyone in the room, even myself, I slowly pull my arm from my mother's grip and step behind Hardin. Hardin's mouth falls open, like he's unsure what I'm doing. Trish and my mother wear identical horrified expressions Teresa. Don't be stupid. Get over here, my mother instructs. In response, I wrap my fingers around Hardin's forearm and stay hidden behind him. I don't really understand why, but I do. I should be leaving with my mother, or forcing Hardin to tell me what the hell Trish is talking about. But, really, I just want my mother to go away. I need a few minutes, hours, some time, to comprehend what's going on. I just forgave Hardin. I just decided to forget everything and move on with him. Why must there always be some secret locked away that comes to a head at the worst possible time? Teresa. My mother takes another step toward me, and Hardin brings his arm back to wrap around me. To protect me from her. Stay away from her, he warns. Trish steps forward. Hardin. That is her daughter. You have no right coming between them. I have no right? She has no right coming into our apartment, into our fucking bedroom, 
Uninvited, he shouts. My grip on his arm tightens. That's not her bedroom, nor is this her apartment, my mother says. Yes. It is. See who she's standing behind? She's using me as a shield to block her from you. Hardin points a thick finger at her. She's just being foolish and doesn't understand what's best for her, but I interrupt her, finally finding part of my voice. Stop speaking as if I'm not here. I'm right here, and I'm an adult, mother. If I want to stay, I will, I announce. With pitying eyes, Trish tries to appeal to me. Tessa, honey. I think you should listen to your mother. The sting of her dismissal burns my chest like a betrayal, but I don't know what she knows about her son. Thank you. My mother sighs. At least someone in this family is reasonable. Trish shoots her a warning glare. Missy, I don't agree with how you treat your daughter, so don't think that we're on the same team here, because we're not. My mother shrugs a little. Regardless, we both agree that you need to go, Tessa. You need to leave this apartment and not come back. We can transfer you to another school if need be. She can make up her own, Hardin starts. He has poisoned your mind, Teresa, look at the things he's done to you. Do you know him at all? My mother asks. I know him, mother, I say through my teeth. My mother turns her attention to Hardin. I don't know why she's not afraid of him, the way his chest is heaving up and down, the way his cheeks are flaring with anger, the way his fists are clenched into ball so tightly that his knuckles are white. He should intimidate her, but she's unfazed as she says, boy, if you care for her, even a little bit, you will tell her to go. You have done nothing but break her down. She isn't the same girl that I dropped off at college three months ago, and that's your fault. You didn't have to see her cry for days over what you did to her. You were probably partying with another girl while she was crying herself to sleep. You have destroyed her, how can you even live with yourself? You know you'll hurt her again sooner or later. So if you have one decent bone in your body, you'll tell her tell her to come with me. The silence in the room is chilling. Trish stands silently staring at the wall, deep in thought, likely mulling over Hardin's past actions. My mother is glaring at Hardin, waiting for his response. Hardin is breathing so hard he may combust. And me, I'm trying to decide which will win the battle inside of me, my heart or my head. I'm not going with you, I finally say. In response to my decision, my adult decision, one that I know, will have consequences I will have to deal with, that will make me endure some very difficult things as I try to figure out whether I can be with a man I love or not, my mother rolls her eyes. And I lose it. You aren't welcome here, don't ever come back. I scream with a bloody rawness in my throat. Who do you think you are, busting in here, and with a nerve, to talk to him that way? I push past Hardin, and come face to face with her. I want nothing to do with you. No one does. That's why you're alone after all these years, you are cruel and conceited. You will never be happy. I take a breath and swallow, feeling just how dry my throat is. My mother stares me down with full self-assurance and more than a little scorn. I am alone because I choose to be. I don't have the need to be with someone. I'm not like you. Like me. I don't need to be with anyone. You basically forced me to be with Noah. I never felt like I had a choice in anything. You have always controlled me, and I am done. I am fucking done. The tears erupt from me then. My mother quirks her lips, like she's considering something in earnest, but her voice is full of sarcasm. It's obvious that you have some codependency issues. Is this because of your father? My eyes soar, surely bloodshot, and filled with every evil I want to inflict on her, I stare at her. Speaking slowly at first, I feel myself frantically escalating as I say, I hate you. I really hate. You. You're the reason he left. Because he couldn't stand you. And I don't blame him, in fact, I wish he would have taken, and right then I feel Hardin's hand clamp over my mouth, and his strong arms pull me back against his chest. Chapter 39. Hardin. The whole time, I had just been thinking, that her mum better not slap her again. I hadn't really considered Tessa going on the offensive like this. Her face is red, and her tears are pouring down my hand. Why does her mum always have to ruin shit? I can't blame her for being angry, 
regardless of how much I hate her. I did hurt Tessa. But I don't think I ruined her. Have I? I don't know what to do. I glance at my mum for help, the look she gives me lets me know that she hates me. I didn't want her to know what I did to Tess. I knew it would kill her, especially after what happened before. But I'm not the same person I was then. This is totally different. I love Tessa. Through all the chaos I caused, I found love. Tessa screams into my hand and tries to push me off of her, but she isn't strong enough. I know one of two things will happen if I don't keep her away, either her mum will slap her, and I'll have to intervene, or Tessa will say something she'll regret forever. I think you need to go now, I say to her mother. Tessa is throwing a fit beneath my grip, and keeps kicking her feet into my shins. It's always so unsettling to see her angry, especially this angry, although part of me is selfishly pleased that her anger isn't directed at me this time. It will be soon I know her mother is right about me, I am terrible for her. I'm not the man Tessa thinks I am, but I love her too much to let her leave me again. I just got her back, and I will not lose her again. I just hope that she will listen to me, listen to the entire story. Even then, I don't think it will matter. I know it's coming. There's no way she'll stay with me once she hears it. Fuck, why did my mom have to say anything? I lead Tessa toward the bedroom. As we go, she twists so hard she spins us both around, so we're facing her mom again. With one last hateful glare, she makes her point and lunges, but I hold tight. Pulling her into our room, I let go, and quickly slam the door and lock it. And she turns her poisonous glare at me. Why did you do that? You, because you're saying things you know you'll regret. Why did you do that, she yells. Why did you stop me? I have so much shit to say to that bitch, it's not even I can't even she pushes her hands against my chest. Hey hey calm down, I say, trying to remember, that she's displacing her anger at her mother toward me, I know she is. I bring her face between my hands, and gently move my thumbs across her cheekbones, making sure she keeps eye contact with me as her breathing slows. Just calm down, baby, I repeat. The redness disappears from her cheeks, and she nods slowly. I'm going to make sure she leaves, okay? I say so low, that it's almost a whisper. She nods again, and moves to sit on the bed. Hurry up, she demands as I leave the room. When I walk into the living room, Tessa's mother is there alone, pacing. She looks up at me sharply, like a jungle cat sensing prey. Where is she, she asks. She's not coming out. You are leaving, and you're not going to come back here. I mean it. I say through my teeth. She raises an eyebrow. Are you threatening me? You can take it however you want, but you need to stay away from her. This manicured woman, so put together and prim looking, gives me a sly hard look that I've only ever seen from people like those in Jace's crew. This is all your fault, she says calmly. You have brainwashed her. She doesn't think for herself anymore. I know what you are doing. I've been with men like you. I knew you were trouble since the day I laid eyes on you. I should have had Tessa change rooms and prevented all of this. No man is going to want her after this after you. Look at you. She waves her hand in the air and turns toward the door. I follow her out into the hallway. That's the point, isn't it? That no man will want her, no man but me. She'll never be with anyone but me, I boast. She will always choose me over you, over anyone. She spins and takes a step toward me. You are the devil, and I'm not going to just go away. She's my daughter, and she's too good for you. I nod my head several times quickly, then look at her flatly. I'll make sure to remember that when I'm burying myself into your daughter tonight. As the words leave my lips, she gasps and reaches her hand up to smack me. I grab her wrist and push it back down gently. I would never hurt her or any woman but neither am I going to let her hurt me. I give her my best smile, before I go back into the apartment, and slam the door in her face. Chapter 40. Harden. I rest with my head against the door for a moment, and when I turn around, my mum is standing in the living room, staring at me with a mug of coffee in her hands, her eyes completely bloodshot. Where were you? I ask. The bathroom, she says, her voice cracking. How could you tell Tessa to go? To leave me? I say. 
I knew she would be disappointed, but that was too much. Because, Hardin, she sighs, lifting her hands, as if it's obvious, you aren't good for her. You know you aren't. I don't want to see her end up like Natalie, or the others. My mum shakes her head. Do you know what will happen to me if she leaves me, mum? I don't think you understand I cannot be without her. I know I'm not good for her, and I regret what I did every single time I look at her, but I can be good for her. I know I can be. I walk to the middle of the living room and start pacing back and forth. Harden are you sure you aren't just feeding into your own game right now? No, mum I lower my head to try and keep calm. This isn't a game to me not this time. I love her, I really love her. I look up at my good kind mother, who I know has had to endure so much. I love her more than I can even begin to tell you, because I don't even understand it myself. I never thought I could or would feel this way. All I know, is that she's my only shot at happiness. If she leaves me, I'll never recover. I won't, mum. She's the only chance I have to not be alone for the rest of my life. I don't know what the fuck I did to deserve her, nothing I know, but she loves me. Do you know how that feels to have someone love you despite all the fucked up shit you do? She's way too good for me, and she loves me. I have no fucking clue why. My mum wipes at her eyes with the back of her hand, making me pause for a moment. It's hard to go on, but I say, she's always there for me, mum. She always forgives me, even when she shouldn't. She always says the right thing. She calms me, but challenges me, she makes me want to be a better man. I know I'm a shitty person, I know that. I have done so much shit, but Tessa can't leave me. I don't want to be alone anymore, and I'll never love anyone again, she's it for me. I know it. She's my ultimate sin, mom, and I'll gladly be damned for her. I'm out of breath by the time I finish, and my mom's cheeks are wet. But she's also staring behind me. I turn to find Tessa with her hands at her sides, her eyes wide, and her cheeks just as wet as my mum's. My mum blows her nose, then softly says, I'm going to go out for a little while give you two some privacy. She goes over to the door, grabs her shoes and coat, and heads out. I feel kind of bad that there aren't many places for her to go on Christmas Eve, especially in the snow, but I need to be alone with Tessa right now. As soon as my mum is out the door, I pat across the room to her. What you said just now you meant it, she asks through her tears. You know I did, I tell her. The corners of her lips turn up, and she reaches across the small space between us to put her hand on my chest. I need to know what you did. I know just promise me that you'll try to understand tell me, Hardin. And that you understand that I'm not proud of any of this. She nods, and I take a deep breath as she leads us to the couch. I really don't know where the fuck to start. Chapter 41. Tessa. Hardin's face pales. He rubs his hands over his knees. He runs his fingers through his hair. He looks up at the ceiling and then back down. He, somewhere deep inside, probably wishes these things would stall this conversation forever. But finally, he begins. I had a group of shitty friends back home. They were like Jays. I guess we would do this thing this game. I guess. We would pick a girl, pick a girl for one another, and see who could fuck their girl first. My stomach drops. Whoever won would get the hottest chick the next week, and there was money involved how many weeks? I ask, regretfully. I don't want to know, yet I have to know. Only five weeks went by before this girl, Natalie. I say, connecting the dots. Hardin looks over at the windows. Yeah Natalie was the last one. And what did you do to her? I am terrified of his answer. The third week James thought Martin was lying, so he came up with the idea of proof proof. That word will always haunt me. The bloodstained sheets pop into my mind, and my chest starts to hurt. Not the same type of proof he knows what I was thinking. Pictures my jaw drops. Pictures? And a video he admits, and covers his face with his large hands. Video? You recorded sex with someone? Did you know? I ask. But I know the answer, even before he shakes his head. How could you? How could you do that to someone? I begin to cry. The realization that I don't know Hardin at all hits me, and I have to swallow the bile rising in my throat. 
I scoot away from him instinctively, and I see pain flare up in his eyes. I don't know I just didn't care. It was fun to me well, not exactly fun, but I didn't care. His honesty slices through me, and for once I long for the days when he kept everything from me. So what happened with Natalie? My voice is coarse as I wipe the tears from my eyes. When James saw the video of her, he wanted to fuck her himself. And when she turned him down, he showed everyone the video. Oh my god. That poor girl. I feel so terrible for what they did to her, what Harden did to her. The video spread so quickly that her parents found out before even a day had passed. Her family was really big in there. Church community so the news didn't go well. They kicked her out of their house, and when word got around, she lost her scholarship to the private university she was going to that fall. You ruined her, I say quietly. Hardin ruined this girl's life, the way he once threatened to ruin mine. Will I end up like her? Am I already just like her? I look at him. You said you'd never been with a virgin before. She wasn't a virgin. She has slept with one guy already. But that's why my mom sent me here. Everyone back home knew about it. I wasn't in the video. Well, I was fucking her in it, but I wasn't visible. Only a few of the tattoos on my arms were. He grinds one fist into the palm of his other hand. That's sort of what I'm known for there now my head is spinning. What did she say when she found out what you did? She said she fell in love with me, and she asked if she could stay at my house until she found somewhere else to go. Did you let her? He shakes his head. Why? Because I didn't want to. I didn't care for her. How can you be so cold about this? Do you not understand what you did to her? Do you let her on? You had sex with her and taped it. You showed your friends, and basically the school, and she lost her scholarship and family because of you. Then you don't even have the compassion to help her when she had nowhere else to go. I shout and stand up. Where is she now? What happened to her? I don't know. I didn't care to find out. The most chilling part of this whole thing is how casual and cold he is about it. This is nauseating. I see the pattern here, I see the similarities between Natalie and me. I was left with nowhere to go because of Hardin too. I have no relationship with my mother because of Hardin. I fell for him while he was using me as part of some sick game. Hardin stands up with me but keeps few feet of space between us. Oh my god my entire body begins to shake. You recorded me, didn't you? No. Fuck no. I would never do that to you. Tessa, I swear to god I did not. I shouldn't, but part of me does believe that part, at least. How many others? I ask. How many others what? Did you record? Just Natalie until I came here. You did it again. After everything you did to that poor girl, you did it again? I scream. Once to Dan's sister, he says. Dan's sister? Your friend Dan? It makes sense now. That's what Jace meant when you were fighting. I had forgotten all about Dan and Hardin's fight, but Jace had hinted about some previous tension between the two of them. Why did you do that if he was your friend? Did you show everyone? No, I didn't show anyone. I deleted it after I sent N a screen grab, I don't know why I did it, really. He was such a dick about telling me to stay away from her when he brought her around the first time that it made me want to fuck her just to piss him off. He's a true asshole anyway, Tessa. How do you not see how fucked up this is? How fucked up you are? I yell. I know it is. I know that, Tessa. I thought my bet was the worst thing you had done, but, oh my god. This is even worse. Natalie's story doesn't hurt me nearly as bad as finding out about Hardin and Zed's bet, but it's worse by being more vile and revolting, and it makes me question everything I thought I knew about Hardin. I knew he wasn't perfect, far from it, but this is a whole new level of disgrace. This was all before you, Tessa, this is my past. Please let it stay that way, he pleads. I'm not the same person now, you've made me a better person. Hardin, you don't even care about what you did to those girls. You don't even feel guilty, do you? I do. I cock my head and squint at him. Only because now I know. When he doesn't argue, I reiterate my point. You didn't care about them, about anyone. You're right. I don't care, 
I honestly don't give a shit about anyone, except you, he shouts back. This is too much, Harden. Even for me the bet, the apartment, the fights, the lies, getting back together, my mother, your mother, Christmas, it's too fucking much. I don't even get a breath between these these messes. As soon as I get over one thing, another comes out. God knows what else you've done. I start crying. I don't know you at all, do I? Yes, you do, Tessa. You do know me. That wasn't me, this is me. This is me now. I love you. I will do anything for you, for you to see, that this is me, the man who loves you more than breathing, the man who dances at weddings, and watches you sleep, the man whose day can't start until you kiss me, the man who would rather die than be without you. That's me, that's who I am. Please don't let this ruin us. Please, baby. His green eyes are glossy, and I'm moved by his words, but it isn't enough. He steps toward me, and I back away. I need to be able to think. I raise my hand in front of me. I need time. This is too much for me right now. His shoulders lower, and he seems relieved. Okay okay take time to think. Away from you, I explain. No, yes Harden. I can't think straight around you. No, Tessa, you're not leaving, he commands. You will not tell me what I will or will not do, I snap. He sighs and wraps his fingers in his hair, tugging hard at the roots. Fine fine let me go, then. You stay here. I want to argue, but I really don't want to leave. I've had enough of hotel rooms, and tomorrow is Christmas. I'll be back in the morning, unless you need more time, he says. He puts his shoes on and reaches for the key rack, before realizing that his mother has taken his car. Take mine, I say. He nods and walks toward me. Don't, I say and bring my hands up in front of me. And you're in your pajamas still. He frowns and looks down, but walks into the bedroom and emerges two minutes later fully dressed. He stops to look me in the eyes. Please remember that I love you, and I have changed, he says once more before leaving me alone in the apartment. Chapter 42. Tessa. What the hell am I going to do? I walk to the bedroom and sit on the edge of the bed. I'm sick to my stomach from all of this. I knew Hardin wasn't a good person before, and I knew there would be some more things that I wouldn't be happy to hear, but of all the things I thought Trish could be referring to, this never, ever crossed my mind. He violated that girl in a terrible deplorable way and he had no remorse, he still barely does. I try to breathe in and out slowly as tears spill down my cheeks. The worst part to me is knowing her name. It's kind of fucked up, but if she was just some anonymous girl, I could almost pretend that she didn't exist. Knowing that her name is Natalie opens up too many thoughts. What does she look like? What did she plan to study in college before Hardin took her scholarship from her? Does she have any brothers or sisters? Did they see the tape? If Trish hadn't brought this up, would I have ever known? How many times did they have sex? Did Hardin like it? Of course he did. It's sex, and obviously Hardin was having a lot of it. With other girls. Lots of other girls. Did he stay the night with Natalie after? Why do I feel jealous of Natalie? I should feel sorry for her, not envy her for touching Hardin. I push the sick. Thought out of my mind and go back to thinking about the type of person Hardin really is. I should have had him stay to talk it out, I always leave, or, in this case, make him leave. The problem is that his presence washes away every ounce of restraint I should have. I wish I knew what happened to Natalie after Hardin demolished her life. If she's happy now, and leading a good life, I'd feel better, slightly. I wish I had a friend, to talk about all of this with, someone to give me advice. Even if I did, I wouldn't divulge Hardin's indiscretion. I do not want anyone to know what he has done to these girls. I know how foolish it is to want to protect him when he doesn't deserve it, but I can't help it. I don't want anyone to think any worse of him, and mostly I don't want him to think any worse of himself than he already does. I lie back against the pillows and stare up at the ceiling. I just got over well, was working on getting over Hardin using me to win a bet, and now this? Natalie, plus four other girls, since he said she was week five. Then Dan's sister. This is a cycle with him, this is what he does, will he be able to stop doing it? 
What would have happened to me if he hadn't fallen in love with me? I know that he loves me. He truly does love me. I know that. And I do love him despite all the mistakes he makes and has made in the past. I've seen changes in him, even in the course of the last week. He has never expressed his feelings about me the way he did today. I just wish that his beautiful declaration hadn't been followed by such an ugly revelation. He said that I'm his only shot at happiness, I'm the only chance that he has to not spend the entirety of his life alone. What a heavy statement. What a true statement. No one will ever love him the way I do. Not because he's not worth loving, but because no one will ever know him the way that I do. Did. Still do. I can't decide, but I want to believe I know him, the true him. Who he is now is not the person he was just a few months ago. Despite the pain he's caused me, he has also done a lot to prove himself to me. He has made a huge effort to be the person I need him to be. He can change. I've seen him change. Half of me thinks that it may be time for me to take some of the blame here, not for what he did to Natalie, but for being so hard on him when change takes time and nobody can erase their past. What he did was wrong, so incredibly wrong, but sometimes I forget that he's an angry lonely man who up until now has never loved anyone. He loves his mother, in his manner, if not the same way that people usually love their parents. The other half of me is tired. Tired of this cycle with Hardin. In the beginning of our relationship, it was a constant back and forth, with him being cruel, then nice, then cruel again. Now the cycle has evolved somewhat, but it's worse. Much worse. I leave him, then come back, then leave him again. I cannot keep doing this, we cannot keep doing this. If there's anything else that he's hiding, it will break me, I'm barely holding myself together now. I can't take any more secrets, any more heartache, any more breakups. I always used to have everything planned, every detail of my life was calculated, overanalyzed, until Hardin. He's completely turned my life upside down, often in a negative way. And yet he's also made me happier than I have ever been. We need to be together and try to move past all of the terrible things he's done, or I need to end things and keep them that way. If I leave him, I need to move away from here, far away. I need to leave behind every reminder of my life with him, or I'll never be able to move on. And suddenly I realize the tears have stopped, telling me that my verdict is in. The pain that comes from considering leaving him is much worse than the pain he has caused me. I can't leave him. I know I can't. I know how pathetic that is, but there's no way I can be without him. No one will ever make me feel the way he does. No one will ever be him. He is it for me, just the way I am it for him. I shouldn't have had him leave. I need a time to think, and I should take more time, but I'm already wanting him back. Is love always like this? Is it always so passionate, yet so damn painful? I have no experience to compare this to. Hearing the front door open, I climb off the bed and rush into the living room. But I'm disappointed to find Trish instead of Hardin. Trish hangs Hardin's keys on the rack and removes her snow-covered shoes. I'm not sure what to say to her, since she told me to leave with my mother. Where is Hardin? She asks as she walks into the kitchen. He left for the night, I explain. She turns to me. Oh. I'm sure if you call him, he'll tell you where he is, if you don't want to stay here with me. Tessa, she says, clearly searching for words, but with sympathy on her face. I'm sorry for what I said. I don't want you to think I have any ill feelings toward you, I don't. I was just trying to protect you from what Hardin can do. I don't want you two to end up like Natalie. I can see that the memory pains her. He told you? Yes. Everything? I hear the doubt in her voice. Yes, the tape, the pictures, the scholarship. Everything. And you're still here? I told him I needed time and space, but yes. I'm not going anywhere. She nods, and we both sit down at the table across from each other. When she looks at me with white eyes, I know what she's thinking, so I say, I know he's done terrible things, deplorable things, but I believe him when he says that he's changed. He isn't that person anymore. Trish puts one hand over the other. Tessa, he's my son, and I love him, but you really have to think about this. He just did the same thing to you that he did before. 
I know that he loves you, that's clear to me now, but I'm just afraid that the damage has been done. I nod, appreciative of her honesty. But I tell her, it hasn't. Well, damage has most certainly been done, but it's not irreversible. And it's my decision to figure out how to deal with his past. And if I hold his past against him, how will he move forward? Is he never deserving of love forevermore? I know you probably think I'm naive and foolish to keep forgiving him, but I love your son, and I cannot be without him either. Trish softly clicks her tongue and shakes her head. Tessa, I don't think you're either of those things. If anything, your forgiveness shows maturity and compassion. My son hates himself, always has, and I thought he always would, until you. I was mortified when your mum told me what he did to you, and for that I'm sorry. I don't know where I went wrong with Hardin. I tried to be the best mother that I could be, but it was so hard with his father not being around. I had to work so much, and I didn't give him the attention that I should have. If I had, maybe he would have more respect for women. I know that, if she hadn't already cried herself out today, she'd be crying now. The guilt in her is so thick, I just want to comfort her. He's not this way because of you. I think it has a lot to do with his feelings about his father and the type of friends he has, both of which I'm trying to work on. Please don't blame yourself. None of this is your fault. Trish reaches across the table, and I give her my hands. Taking them in hers, she says, you are certainly the most kind-hearted person I've met in all of my 35 years. I arch my brow. 35? Hey, just go with it. I can pass, right? She smiles. Definitely. I laugh. 20 minutes ago I was just crying and on the verge of a breakdown, and now I'm laughing with Trish. The moment I decided to let Hardin's past be his past, I felt most of the tension leave my body. Maybe I should call him and tell him what I've decided, I say. Trish tilts her head to the side and smirks. I think he could use a little time to stir. The idea of torturing him further isn't appealing, but he does need to really think about everything he's done. I guess so I think he needs to know that there are consequences for bad choices. She gets a twinkle in her eye. How about I make us dinner, and then you can put Hardin out of his misery? I'm happy to have her humor and guidance to bring me out of my sad confusion over Hardin's past. I'm willing to move beyond this, or at least try, but he needs to know this type of thing is not okay, and I need to know if there are any more demons from his past that are waiting to railroad me. What would you like? Anything is fine. I can help, I offer, but she shakes her head. You just relax as much as you can. You've had a long day, what with everything from Hardin and your mum. I roll my eyes. Yeah, she's difficult. She smiles and opens the refrigerator. Difficult? I was going to use another word, but she is your mother she's sort of a b-word, I say, not wanting to say the real word in front of Trish. Oh yeah, she's a bitch. I'll say it for you. She laughs, and I join in. Trish cooks chicken tacos for dinner, and we make small talk about Christmas, the weather, and everything else except what is actually on my mind, Hardin. Eventually, I feel like it's literally killing me not to call him and tell him to come home now. Do you think he's stirred long enough? I say, not admitting that I've been counting the minutes. No, but it's not my choice, his mother says. I have to. I leave the kitchen to call Hardin. When he answers, the surprise in his voice is evident. Tessa? Hardin, we still have a lot to discuss, but I would like it if you could come home so we can talk. Already? Yeah, yeah, of course. He rushes the words. I'll be there shortly. Okay, I say and hang up. I don't have much time to go over everything in my head before he arrives. I need to stand my ground and make sure that he knows what he did is wrong but that I love him anyway. I pace back and forth across the chill concrete floor, waiting. After what seems like an hour, the front door opens, and I listen as his boots thud down the small hallway. When he opens the bedroom door, my heart breaks for the thousandth time. His eyes are swollen and bloodshot. He doesn't say anything. Instead, he walks over and places a small object in my hand. Paper? I look up at him as he closes my fist around the folded up paper. 
read it before you make up your mind, he says softly. Then, with a swift kiss to my temple, he goes into the living room. Chapter 43. Tessa. As I unfold the paper, my eyes widen in surprise. The entirety of the sheet is covered with black scribbles, front and back. It's a letter, a handwritten letter from Hardin. I'm almost afraid to read it, but I know that I must. Tess, since I'm not good with words, when trying to relate my inner life, I may have stolen some from Mr. Darcy, whom you fancy so much. I write without any intention of paining you, or humbling myself, by dwelling on wishes which, for the happiness of both, cannot be too soon forgotten, and the effort which the formation, and the perusal of this letter must occasion, should have been spared, had not my character required it to be written and read. You must, therefore, pardon the freedom with which I demand your attention. Your feelings, I know, will bestow it unwillingly, but I demand it of your justice I know that I've done, so many fucked up things to you, and that I in no way deserve you, but I'm asking, no, begging, you to please look past the things that I have done. I know I ask too much of you, always, and I'm sorry for that. If I could take it all back, I would. I know you are angry and disappointed by my actions, and that kills me. Instead of making excuses for the way I am, I'm going to tell you about me, the me that you never knew. I'm starting with the shit I remember, I'm sure there is more, but I swear not to purposely hide anything else from you from this day forth. When I was around nine, I stole my neighbor's bike and broke the wheel, then lied about it. That same year I threw a baseball through the living room window and lied about it. Do you know about my mother and the soldiers? My father left shortly after, and I was glad when he did. I didn't have many friends, because I was an asshole. I picked on kids in my year, a lot. Every day, basically. I was a dick to my mom, that was the last year I told her I love her. The teasing and being a dick to everyone continued until now, so I can't name all the instances, but just know it was a lot. Around 13, me and some friends broke into the drugstore down the road from my house and stole a bunch of random shit. I don't know why we did it, but when one of my friends got caught, I threatened him to make him take the blame for it, and he did. I smoked my first cigarette when I was 13. It tasted like shit, and I coughed for 10 minutes. I never smoked again until I started smoking pot, but I'll get to that. When I was 14 I lost my virginity to my friend Mark's older sister. She was a whore and 17 at the time. It was an awkward experience, but I liked it. She slept with all of our friends, not just me. After I had sex the first time I didn't do it again until I was 15, but after that I couldn't stop. I would hook up with random girls at parties. I always lied about my age, and the girls were easy. None of them cared about me and I didn't give a fuck about them. I started smoking pot the same year, and did it often. I started drinking around this time, me and my friends would steal liquor from their parents, or from anywhere else we could. I started fighting a lot too. I got my ass beat a few times, but most of the time I won. I was always so fucking angry, always, and it felt good to hurt someone else. I would pick fights with people all the time for fun. The worst one was with this boy named Tucker who came from a poor family. He wore the oldest radius clothes, and I fucking tortured him for it. I would mark on his shirt with a pen, just to prove how many times he wore it without washing it. Fucked up, I know. So anyway, one day I saw him walking, and I knocked him in the shoulder, just to be a dick. He got angry, and called me a dick, so I beat the shit out of him. His nose was broken, and his mom couldn't afford to even have him see a doctor. I still kept fucking with him afterward. A few months later his mom died, and he went into a foster home, a rich one, lucky for him, and he drove by me one day. It was my 16th birthday, and he was in a brand new car. I was angry at the time and wanted to find him, just to break his nose again, but now that I think about it, I'm happy for him. I'll skip the rest of my 16th year, because all I did was drink, get high, and fight. Actually that goes for 17 too. I keyed a few cars, busted some windows as well. When I was 18 is when I met James. He was cool, because he didn't give a fuck about anything, like me. We drank every day, our group. 
I would come home drunk every night and would puke on the floor and my mum would have to clean it up. I would break something new almost every night we had our own little gang of friends and no one fucked with us. They knew better. The game started, the ones I told you about, and you know what happened with Natalie. That was the worst of that, I swear. I know you are disgusted by me not caring about what happened to her. I don't know why I didn't care, but I didn't. Just now, when I was driving here to this empty hotel room, I was thinking about Natalie. I still don't feel as bad as I should, but I was thinking, what if someone did that to you? I nearly had to pull over to get sick even thinking about you being in Natalie's place. I was wrong, so wrong for doing that to her. One of the other girls, Melissa, got attached to me as well, but nothing came of it. She was obnoxious and loud. I told everyone that she had hygiene problems down there so everyone gave her shit about it, and she never bothered me again. I got arrested once for being drunk in public, and my mom was so angry she left me at the police station all night. Then when everyone found out about the Natalie shit, she had enough. I threw a fit when my mom mentioned sending me to America. I didn't want to leave my life back home, no matter how fucked up it was, I was. But when I beat the shit out of someone in front of a crowd during a festival, mom was done. I applied to WCU and got in, of course. When I got here to America I fucking hated it. I hated everything. I was so upset that I had to be near my father that I rebelled even further, drinking and partying at the frat house all the time. I met Steph first. I hooked up with her at a party and she introduced me to the rest of her friends. Nate and I hit it off the best. Dan and Jace were dicks, Jace the worst. Do you already know about Dan's sister, so I'll skip that. There were a few girls that I fucked since then, but not as many as your imagination will have you think. I did sleep with Molly once after you and I kissed, but the only reason I did it was because I couldn't stop thinking about you. I couldn't get you out of my head, Tess. I kept thinking it was you the entire time. I had hoped that would help, but it didn't. I knew it wasn't you. You would have been better. I kept telling myself, if I only see Tessa one more time I will realize this is just a ridiculous fascination, nothing more. Purely lust. But every time I saw you, I wanted more and more. I would think of ways to annoy you, just so I could hear you say my name. I wanted to know what you were thinking of in class, that made you stare at your book with a frown, I wanted to smooth the crease between your brows, I wanted to know what you and Landon whispered about. I wanted to know what you were writing in that damn planner of yours. I actually almost took it from you once, that day when you dropped it and I handed it to you. You probably don't remember, but you were wearing a purple shirt, and that hideous grey skirt you used to wear almost every other day. After that day in your dorm, when I fucked up your notes and kissed you against the wall, I was in too deep to stay away. I thought about you constantly. My every thought was consumed by you. I didn't know what it was at first, I didn't know why I had become so obsessed with you. The first time that you stay the night with me is when I knew, knew that I loved you. I knew that I would do anything for you. I know that sounds like bullshit now, after all that I've put you through, but it's true. I swear it. I found myself daydreaming, me daydreaming about the life that I could have with you. I pictured you sitting on the couch with a pen between your teeth and a novel on your lap your feet on my lap. I don't know why, but I couldn't get the image out of my head. It tortured me, wanting you the way that I did, and knowing you would never feel the same. I threatened anyone who tried to sit in that seat next to you, threatened Landon, to make sure that I could sit there, just to be near you. I would tell myself over and over that I was only doing all of this weird shit to win the bet. I knew that I was lying to myself, I just wasn't ready to admit it. I would do shit, like crazy shit, to fuel my obsession with you. I would mark lines in my novels that reminded me of you. Do you want to know the first one? It was, he stepped down, trying not to look long at her, as if she were the sun, yet he saw her, like the sun, even without looking. I knew I loved you, when I was highlighting fucking Tolstoy. When I told you I loved you in front of everyone, I meant it, I was just too much of a prick to admit it once you dismissed me. The day that you told me you loved me was the first time I felt like there was hope, hope for me. Hope for us. 
I don't know why I kept hurting you and treating you the way that I did. I won't waste your time with an excuse because I don't have one. I just have all these bad instincts and habits and I'm fighting against them for you. All I know is that you make me happy, Tess. You love me when you shouldn't and I need you. I have always needed you and always will. When you left me just last week it nearly killed me, I was so lost. So completely lost without you. I went on a date with someone last week. I wasn't going to tell you, but I can't stand to chance losing you again. I wouldn't even call it a date, really. Nothing happened between us. I almost kissed her, but I stopped myself. I couldn't kiss her, I couldn't kiss anyone but you. She was boring, and nothing compared to you. No one is, no one ever will be. I know it's probably too late for this, especially now that you know all of the fucked up shit I've done. I can only pray that you will love me the same after reading this. If not, that's okay. I will. Understand. I know you can do better than me. I'm not romantic, I won't ever write you poetry or sing you a song. I'm not even kind. I can't promise that I won't hurt you again, but I can swear that I will love you until the day that I die. I'm a terrible person and I don't deserve you, but I hope that you will allow me the chance to restore your faith in me. I am sorry for all the pain I have caused you and I understand if you can't forgive me. Sorry. This letter wasn't supposed to be this long. I guess I fucked up more than I thought. I love you. Always. Harden. I sit and stare at the paper in a daze, then reread it twice. I had no idea what I expected, but this was not it. How can he say he isn't romantic? The charm bracelet on my wrist in this beautiful, somewhat disturbing, but mostly beautiful letter shows otherwise. He even used the first paragraph of Darcy's letter to Elizabeth. Now that he's bared himself to me, I can't help but love him more. He has done a lot of things that I would never do, terrible things that hurt many people, but the thing that matters most to me is that he doesn't do them anymore. He hasn't always done the right thing, but I can't ignore all the effort he's made to show me that he's changing, trying to change. That he loves me. I hate to admit it, but there is a sort of poetry to him never caring for anyone except me. I stare at the letter a little longer until there is a knock at the bedroom door. Folding the sheet up, I put it in the bottom drawer of the dresser. I don't want Hardin to try to make me throw it away or tear it up now that I've read it. Come in, I say and walk over to the door to meet him. He opens the door, already staring at the ground. Did you I did I reach up and lift his chin to look at me, the way he usually does to me. His bloodshot eyes are so wide and sad. It was stupid I knew I shouldn't have he begins. No, it wasn't. It wasn't stupid at all. I move my hand from under his chin, but he keeps his red eyes on mine. Harden, it was everything that I've been wanting you to say to me for so long. I'm sorry that I took so long and that I wrote it down it was just easier. I'm not good at saying things. The red of his weary eyes is beautiful against the vibrant green of his er eyes. I know you aren't. Did you should we talk about it? Do you need more time now that you know how fucked up I truly am? He frowns and looks at the floor again. You aren't. You were you've done a lot of things bad things, Harden. He nods in agreement. I can't stand to see him feel so bad about himself, even with his history. But that doesn't mean you're a bad person. You've done bad things, but you aren't a bad person anymore. He looks up. What? I take his face between my hands. I said you aren't a bad person, Harden. You really think that? Did you read what I wrote? Yes, and the fact that you wrote it proves that you aren't. Confusion is clear on his perfect face. How can you say that? I don't understand, you wanted me to give you space, and you read all that shit, and you still say that? I don't understand I run my thumbs over his cheeks. I read it, and now that I know everything that you've done, my mind hasn't changed. Oh his eyes become glossy. The idea of him crying again, especially in front of me, pains me. He's obviously not getting what I'm trying to say. I already made my mind up while you were gone to stay. And after reading what you wrote, I want to stay more than ever. I love you, Hardin. Chapter 44. Tessa. Hardin takes my hands and holds them for a second before. 
wrapping his arms around me, as if I'll disappear, should he let go. As I said the words I want to stay, I realized how freeing this all is. I no longer have to worry that secrets from Hardin's past will come back to haunt us. I no longer have to wait for someone to drop a huge bombshell on me. I know everything. I finally know everything he's been hiding. I can't help but think of the phrase sometimes it is better to be kept in the dark than to be blinded by the light. But I don't think that applies me to right now. I'm disturbed by the things he has done, but I love him and have chosen to not let his past affect us any longer. Hardin pulls back and sits on the edge of the bed. What are you thinking? Do you have any questions about anything? I want to be honest with you. I move to stand between his legs. He flips my hands over in his and traces small patterns on my palms as he searches my face for clues to how I am feeling. No I do wish I knew what happened to Natalie, but I don't have any questions. I am done being that person, you know that, don't you? I've already told him I do, but I know he needs to hear it again. I know that. I really do, babe. His eyes dart to mine at the use of the word. Babe. He arches his eyebrow. I don't know why I said that I flush. I've never called him anything other than Hardin, so it does feel a little odd to call him babe like he does me. No I like it. He smiles. I've missed your smile, I tell him, and his fingers stop their movements. I've missed yours too. He frowns. I don't make you smile enough. I want to say something to remove that doubt from his face, but I don't want to lie to him. He needs to know how I feel. Yeah we need to work on that, I say. His fingers move again, drawing little hearts on my palm. I don't know why you love me. It doesn't matter why I love you, only that I do. The letter was stupid, wasn't it? No. Would you stop with the self-loathing? It was wonderful. I read it three times straight. It really made me happy to read the things that you were thinking about me about us. He looks up, half smirking, half concerned. You knew I loved you. Yes but it was nice to know the small things, the way you remembered what I was wearing. Those types of things. You never say those types of things. Oh. He looks embarrassed. It is still slightly unnerving to have Hardin be the vulnerable one in our relationship. That role has always been mine. Don't be embarrassed, I say. His arms wrap around my waist and pull me onto his lap. I'm not, he lies. I run one of my hands through his hair and wrap my other arm around his shoulder. I think you are, I challenge softly, and he laughs, burying his head in my neck. What a Christmas Eve. It's been a long ass day, he complains, and I can't help but agree. Way too long. I can't believe my mother came here. She is so unbelievable. Not really, he says, and I pull back to look at him. What? She's not being unreasonable, really. Yeah, she goes about it the wrong way, but I can't blame her for not wanting you to be with someone like me. Tired of this talk, and his notion, that my mother is somehow right about him, I scowl at him, and move off of his lap, to sit next to him on the bed. Tess, don't look at me like that. I'm just saying, that now that I've really thought about all the shit I've done, I don't blame her for worrying. Well, she's wrong, and we can stop talking about her, I whine. The emotional turmoil of the day, of the year, really, is making me tired and cranky. The year is almost over. I can't believe it. Okay, so what would you like to talk about, he asks. I don't know something lighter. I smile, convincing myself to be less cranky. Like how romantic you can be. I am not romantic, he scoffs. Yes, you most certainly are. That letter was one for the classics, I tease. He rolls his eyes. It wasn't a letter, it was a note. A note that was only supposed to be a paragraph at most. Sure. A romantic note, then. Oh, would you shut up he groans comically. I wrap a lock of his hair around my finger and laugh. Is this where you annoy me to get me to say your name? He moves too quickly for me to respond, grabbing my waist and pushing me back onto the bed, hovering over me with his hands on my hips. No. I have since come up with other ways to get you to say my name, he breathes, his lips against my ear. My entire body ignites with only a few words from Hardin. Is that so? I say in a thick voice. 
but suddenly Natalie's faceless figure appears in my mind, causing my stomach to turn. I think we should wait until your mother isn't in the other room, I suggest, partly because I clearly need more time to ease back into our relationship, but also because it was already awkward enough doing it once before while she was here. I can kick her out now, he jokes, but rolls off to lie next to me. Or I could kick you out. I'm not leaving again. Neither are you. The certainty in his tone makes me smile. We are lying next to each other, both of us staring at the ceiling. So this is it, then, we're done with the back and forth? I ask. Yes, this is it. No more secrets, no more running away. Do you think you can manage not leaving me for a week at least? I push his shoulder with my arm and laugh. Do you think you can manage to not piss me off for a week at least? Yeah, probably not, he answers. I know that he's smiling. As I turn my head to the side, sure enough, a huge grin covers his face. You'll have to stay with me at my dorm sometimes too. The drive is far. Your dorm? You weren't living in a dorm. You live here. We just got back together, do you really think that's a good idea? You're staying here. We aren't discussing this any further. You are obviously confused, to be speaking to me that way, I say, then raise myself up on an elbow to look at him. I shake my head lightly, and give a slight smile. I don't really want to live in the dorm, I just wanted to see what you would say. Well, he says, lifting himself up and mirroring my actions, I'm glad to see you're back to being annoying. I'm glad to see you're back to being rude. I was getting worried that after that romantic letter you had maybe lost your edge. Call me romantic one more time, and I'll take you right here, right now, mum or no mum. My eyes widen, and he laughs louder than I think I've ever heard him laugh. I'm joking. You should see your face, he bellows. I can't help but laugh with him. After we stop, he admits, I feel like we shouldn't be laughing after all the stuff that happened today. Maybe that's why we should be laughing. This is what we do, we fight, then make up. Our relationship is sort of fucked up. He smiles. Yeah, just a little. It has definitely been a roller coaster. Not anymore, though, okay? I promise. Okay. I lean over and give him a quick kiss on the lips. It isn't enough, though. It never is. I bring my lips back to his, and this time I let them linger. Both of our lips part at the same time, and he slips his tongue inside my mouth. My hands fist his hair, and he pulls me on top of him as his tongue massages mine. No matter how messed up our relationship has been, there is no denying our all-consuming passion. I start to move my hips, grinding down onto him, and I feel him smile against my lips. I think that's enough for now, he says. Nodding, I shift and lay my head on his chest, reveling in the feeling of his arms wrapping around my back. I hope tomorrow goes well, I say after a few minutes of silence. He doesn't respond. And when I lift up my head, his eyes are closed, and his lips are slightly parted in sleep. He must have been exhausted. Then again, so my eye climb off of him, and check the time. It's past 11. I pull his jeans off him, gently so not to wake him, then snuggle up next to him. Tomorrow is Christmas, and I can only pray that it goes much better than today. Chapter 45. Harden. Harden. Tessa's voice is soft. I groan and pull my arm from under her weight. I grab the pillow and cover my face with it. Not getting up yet. We slept late, and we have to get ready. She snatches the pillow from me and tosses it onto the floor. Stay in bed with me. Let's cancel. I reach for her arm, and she rolls onto her side, molding her body to mine. We can't cancel Christmas. She laughs as she speaks and presses her lips against my neck. I rock into her, pushing my hips against hers, and she playfully pulls away. Oh no you don't. Her hands push at my chest, to keep me from rolling on top of her. She climbs out of bed, leaving me alone. I have half a mind, to follow her into the bathroom, not to do anything to her, just to be near her. Yet the bed is too warm, so I decide against it. I'm still reeling from the fact that she's still here. Her forgiveness and acceptance of me will never fail to surprise the fuck out of me. Having her here for Christmas will be different too. I've never really given a shit about holidays like this, 
but watching Tess's face light up over some stupid tree with overpriced ornaments makes the whole thing a little more tolerable. My mum being here isn't too bad either. Tess's seems to adore her, and my mum is almost as obsessed with my girl as I am. My girl. Tessa is my girl again, and I'm spending Christmas with her, and my fucked up family. What a difference from last year, when I spent Christmas Day wasted out of my mind. A few minutes later I force myself out of bed, and find my way to the kitchen. Coffee. I need coffee. Merry Christmas, my mum says when I enter the kitchen. Same to you. I walk past her to the fridge. I made coffee, she says. I see that. I grab the frosted flakes from on top of the fridge and walk over to the coffee pot. Harden, I'm sorry for what I said yesterday. I know that I upset you when I agreed with Tessa's mom, but you have to see where I was coming from. The thing is, I do understand where she's coming from, but it's not her damn place to tell Tessa to leave me. After everything Tessa and I have been through, we need someone on our side. It feels like it's only her and me fighting against everyone, and I need my mom to be on our side. It's just that she belongs with me, mom, nowhere else. Only with me. I grab a towel to wipe up the excess coffee spilling over my mug. The brown liquid stains the white towel, and I can almost hear Tessa's voice scolding me for using the wrong towel. I know she does, Harden. I see that now. I'm sorry. Me too. I'm sorry for being a dick all the time. I don't mean to be. She seems to be surprised by my words. I guess I don't blame her. I never apologize, regardless if I am right or wrong. It's my thing, I guess, being an asshole and not owning up to it. It's okay, we can move past it. Let's have a nice Christmas at your lovely father's house. She smiles, sarcasm clear in her voice. Yeah, let's move past it. Yes. Let's. I don't want today to be ruined because of that mess last night. I understand it better now, the whole situation. I know you love her, Hardin, and I can see you're learning to be a better man. She's teaching you, and that makes me so happy. My mum brings her hands to her chest, and I roll my eyes. Really, I'm so happy for you, she says. Thanks. I look away. I love you, mum. The words taste odd coming out but her expression makes it worth it. She gasps. What did you just say? Tears immediately pool in her eyes from hearing the words I never say to her. I don't know what made me say it just now, maybe the way she truly only wants the best for me. Maybe the way she's here now, and she really has played such a big role in Tessa's forgiving me. I don't know, but the look on her face makes me wish I'd have said it sooner. She's dealt with a lot of shit, and she really has tried her best to be a good mum to me, she should have had the simple pleasure of hearing her only child say that he loves her more than once in the last 13 years. I was just so angry, still am, but it's not her fault. It never has been her fault. I love you, mum, I repeat, a little embarrassed. She pulls me into her arms and hugs me tighter, tighter than I usually allow. Oh, Hardin, I love you too. So much, son. Chapter 46. Tessa. I decide to wear my hair straight to try something different. But when I finish, it looks odd, so I end up curling it as usual. I'm taking too long to get ready, and it's probably getting close to time to leave. Perhaps I'm taking longer, because part of me is stalling, nervous about how today will go. I hope Hardin is on his best behavior, or at least tries to be. I go with simple makeup, only wearing a little foundation, black eyeliner, and mascara. I was going to use eyeshadow as well, but I've had to remove the messy line from my top eyelid three times before finally getting it right. You live in there? Hardin's voice calls through the door. Yes, I'm almost done, I reply and brush my teeth once more. I'm going to take a quick shower, but then we need to go, if you want to be there on time, Hardin says when I open the door. Okay, okay, I'll get rest while you shower. He disappears into the bathroom, and I head for the closet, grabbing the sleeveless forest green dress I bought to wear today. The dark green material is thick, and the neckline is high. The bow covering my waist is much bigger than it looked when I tried it on the other day, but I'll have a cardigan over it anyway. 
I retrieve my charm bracelet from the dresser, and my stomach flutters as I read and reread the perfect inscription. I can't decide on what shoes to wear, if I wear heels, I'll probably look too dressy. I go with black flats, and I'm pulling my white cardigan over the dress, just as Hardin opens the door wearing only a towel tied around his waist. Oh. No matter how many times I see him, I still lose my breath at the sight of him. Staring at Hardin's half-naked body, I do not understand how tattoos were not my thing before. Holy shit, he says as his eyes rake up and down my body. What? What? I look down to see what's wrong. You look incredibly innocent. Wait, is that good or bad? It's Christmas, I didn't want to look indecent. I suddenly feel unsure of what I chose to wear. Oh, it's good. Very good. His tongue snakes over his bottom lip, and I finally get it, blushing and looking away, before we start something that we should not finish. Not right now, at least. Thank you. What are you wearing? What I always wear. I look back at him. Oh. I'm not dressing up to go to my dad's house. I know maybe you could wear that shirt your mother got you for Christmas. I suggest, even though I know he won't. He barks out a laugh. Not happening. He goes to the closet and pulls his jeans off the hanger, which falls to the ground, not that he notices such things. I decide not to say anything. Instead I walk away from the closet as Hardin's towel falls to the floor. I'm going to go out there with your mom, I squeak out, trying to force myself not to look at his body. Suit yourself. He smirks, and I leave the room. When I find Trish in the living room, she's wearing a red dress and black heels, much different from her usual tracksuit. You look so beautiful. I tell her. You're sure? Is it too much? With the makeup and all, she asks nervously. It's not that I care, really, I just don't want to look bad when I see my ex-husband after all these years. Trust me, bad is the last thing you look, I tell her, which gets her to smile a little. Do you two ready? Hardin asks when he joins us in the living room. His hair is still wet, but somehow it manages to look perfect. He's wearing all black, including the black converses he wore in Seattle that I love. His mother doesn't seem to notice the all-black attire, likely because she's still focusing on her own appearance. As we get into the elevator, Hardin looks at his mother, as if for the first time, then asks, why are you so dressed up? She blushes a little. It's a holiday, why wouldn't I be? It just seems weird, I cut him off before he says something to ruin his mother's day. She looks lovely, Hardin. I'm just as dressed up as she is. During the drive, everyone is quiet, even Trish. I can tell she's anxious, and who could blame her? I'd be incredibly nervous too. In fact, for different reasons, the closer we get to Ken's house, the more I feel it. I really just want a calm holiday. When we finally arrive and park at the curb, I hear Trish gasp. This is his house? Yep. I told you it was big, Hardin says and turns off the car. I didn't think you meant this big, she says quietly. Hardin hops out and opens his mother's door since she's just sitting there in shock. I get out myself, and as we walk up the steps leading to the large house, I see the apprehension on his face. I take his hand in mine, to try to calm him, and he looks down at me with a small but noticeable smile. He doesn't ring the doorbell, he just opens the door and walks inside. Karen is standing in the living room with a beaming, welcoming smile that's so infectious it makes me feel a little better. Hardin walks through the foyer first with his mom, and I follow behind him, my hand still in his. Thank you all for coming Karen says, approaching Trish, since it's just understood Hardin's not one for introductions. Hello, Trish, I'm Karen she says, and extends her hand. It's so nice to get a chance to meet you. I really appreciate you coming. Karen appears completely calm, but I've gotten to know her well enough to know that's not really the case. Hi, Karen, it's nice to meet you, too Trish says, and shakes her hand. Just then Ken enters the room and, doing a double take when he sees us, stops dead in his tracks and stares at his ex-wife. I lean into Hardin and hope that Landon told Ken we were coming. Hello, Ken, Trish says, her voice sounding stronger than it's been all morning. Trish wow hello, he stammers. Trish, 
who I'm guessing is pleased by his reaction, nods her head once and says, you look different. I've tried to imagine what Ken looked like back then, eyes likely bloodshot from liquor, forehead sweaty, face pale, but I can't seem to. Yes so do you, he says. The awkward tension is making me dizzy, so I'm beyond relieved, when Karen suddenly exclaims Landon, and he joins us. Karen's clearly relieved to see the apple of her eye right now, and he looks the part, dressed in blue slacks and a white dress shirt with a black tie. You look beautiful. He compliments me, and pulls me in for a hug. Hardin's grip on my hand tightens, but I manage to pull my hand free and hug Landon back. You look very nice yourself, Landon, I say. Hardin hooks his arm around my waist, and pulls me back over to him, closer than before. Landon rolls his eyes at Hardin, then turns to Trish. Hello, ma'am, I'm Landon, Karen's son. It's great to finally meet you. Oh, please don't call me ma'am. Trish laughs. But it's very nice to meet you too. Tessa has told me a lot about you. He smiles. All good things, I hope. Mostly, she teases. Landon's charm seems to ease some of the tension in the room, and Karen pipes up, well, you all are just in time. The goose is ready to be served in just a couple of minutes. Ken leads us to the dining room, while Karen disappears into the kitchen. I'm not at all surprised to find the table perfectly set with their best china, polished silverware, and elegant wooden napkin rings. Platters of neatly arranged food cover the table. The main goose dish is surrounded by thick slices of oranges. A bundle of red berries rests atop the body. It's so elegantly arranged, and the smell makes my mouth water. A plate of roasted potatoes is directly in front of me. The scent of garlic and rosemary fills the air, and I admire the rest of the table. A large centerpiece full of flowers and ornaments sits in the middle, and each decoration echoes the same orange and berry theme. Karen is always an amazing host. Would anyone like a drink? I have some delicious red wine from the cellar, she says. Her cheeks flush red as she realizes what she just asked. Alcohol is definitely a sensitive subject with this crowd. Trish smiles. I would, actually. Karen disappears, and we're so silent, that when she pops the cork in the kitchen, it's a loud sound, that feels like it bounces off the walls around us. When she returns with an open bottle, I consider asking for a glass, to calm the uneasy feeling in my stomach, but then decide against it. The hostess returned, each of us takes a seat, Ken at the head of the table, Karen, Landon, and Trish on one side of him, Hardin and I on the other. After some oohs and ahs at the presentation, no one says a word as they fill their plates with food. After we've all had a few bites, Landon makes eye contact with me, and I can tell he's debating whether or not to speak. I give him a small nod. I don't want to have to break the silence. I take a bite of goose, and Hardin puts his hand on my thigh. Landon wipes his mouth with his napkin and turns to Trish. So what do you think of America so far, Mrs. Daniels? Is this your first time here? She nods a couple of times. Indeed, it is my first time here. I like it. I wouldn't want to live here, but I do like it. Are you planning on staying in Washington when you finish university? She looks at Ken, as if she was asking him instead of Landon. I'm not sure yet. My girlfriend is moving to New York next month, so it will depend on what she wants to do. I selfishly hope he doesn't move out there anytime soon. Well, I'll be glad when Hardin finishes, so he can move back home, Trish says, and I drop my fork onto my plate. All eyes focus on me, and I smile apologetically, before picking the utensil back up. You're moving back to England after you graduate? Landon asks Hardin. Yeah, of course I am, Hardin answers rudely. Oh, Landon says, looking directly at me. Hardin and I haven't discussed any plans after college, but him going back to England never once crossed my mind. We will need to discuss this later, not in front of everyone. And you how do you like America, Ken? Are you planning to live here permanently? Trish asks him. Yes, I love it here. I'll be staying most definitely, he answers. Trish smiles and takes a slow sip of her wine. You always hated America. Yes I did, he replies and half smiles back at her. 
Karen and Hardin both shift uncomfortably in their seats, and I concentrate on chewing the bite of potato in my mouth. Does anyone have anything to talk about besides America? Hardin rolls his eyes. I gently kick him under the table, but he doesn't acknowledge it. Karen jumps in quickly, asking me, how was your trip to Seattle, Tessa? I've definitely already told her about it, but I know that she's only trying to make conversation, so I tell everyone about the conference and my job again. That gets us through the meal at least, as everyone keeps asking me questions in a clear effort to stay on the safe, non-ex-wife and ex-husband topic. Once everyone is done with the delicious goose and sides, I help Karen take the dishes to the kitchen. She seems to be distracted, so I don't probe her for conversation as we clean up the kitchen. Would you like another glass of wine, Trish? Karen asks once we all move to the living room. Hardin, Trish, and I sit on one of the couches, Landon sits on the chair, and Karen and Ken sit on the other couch across from us. It feels as if we are on teams, with Landon acting as a referee. Yes, please. It's got a really great taste. Trish replies and hands over her empty glass for Karen to fill. Thank you, we got it in Greece this summer. It was such an amazing, she stops mid-sentence. After a pause, she adds, a nice place, before handing Trish back her glass. Trish smiles and gives a little air salute. Well, the wine is excellent. At first I'm confused by this awkwardness, but then I realize that Karen has gotten the Ken that Trish never had. She gets trips to Greece and all over the world, a huge home, new cars, and most importantly she gets a loving and sober husband. I really applaud Trish for being so strong and forgiving. She's making a huge effort to be polite, especially given the circumstances. Anyone else? Tessa, would you like a glass? Karen asks as she finishes pouring one for Landon. I look toward Trish and Hardin. Only one, for the holiday, Karen adds. I finally give in and reply, yes please. I'm going to need a glass of wine, if the day continues to be this awkward. As she pours, I see Hardin nodding his head next to me several times. And then he remarks, what about you, dad? Do you want a glass of wine? Everyone looks at him with white eyes and open mouths. I squeeze his hand, to try to silence him. But he continues with a wicked smirk. What? No? Come on. I'm sure you do. I know you miss it. Chapter 47. Tessa. Hardin. Trish snaps. What? I'm just offering the man a drink. Being social, he says. I watch Ken, who I can tell, is debating whether or not to take Hardin's bait, whether to let this become a full-blown argument. Stop it, I whisper to Hardin. Don't be rude, Trish tells him. Ken finally reacts. It's fine, he says and takes a drink of his water. I look around the room. Karen's face has paled. Landon is staring at the large television on the wall. Trish downs her wine. Ken looks bemused, and Hardin is glaring at him. Then he shows a simmering smile. I know it's fine. You are just angry, so go ahead and say what you please, Ken says. He shouldn't have said that. He shouldn't have treated Hardin's emotion in this area so trivially like it was a young boy's opinion that merely had to be endured for a moment. Angry? I'm not angry. Annoyed and amused, yes, but angry, no, Hardin says calmly. Amused by what? Ken asks. Oh, Ken, just stop talking. Amused by the fact that you're acting as if nothing ever happened, as if you weren't a massive fuck-up. He points at Ken and Trish. You two are being ridiculous. You're crossing the line here, Ken says. Jesus, Ken. Am I? Since when do you get to decide where the line is? Hardin challenges him. Since this is my home, Hardin. That's why I get to decide. Hardin is on his feet immediately. I grab his arm to stop him, but he shakes me off easily. I quickly set my glass of wine on the side table and get up. Hardin, stop. I beg and grab hold of his arm again. Everything was going well. Awkward, but well. And then Hardin had to go and make a rude remark. I know he's angry at his father for his mistakes, but Christmas dinner is not the time to bring this up. Hardin and Ken have begun to repair their relationship, and if Hardin doesn't stop now, it will get much worse. 
Ken stands up with an air of authority and asks, much like a professor might, I thought we were moving past this. You came to the wedding? They're only feet away from each other, and I know this will not end well. Moving past what? You haven't even owned up to anything. You're just pretending that it didn't happen. Hardin is yelling now. My head is swimming, and I wish I had never extended Landon's invite to Hardin and Trish. Once again I've caused a family argument. Today is not the day for us to be discussing this, Hardin. We're having a nice time, and you had to go and start a fight with me, Ken says. Hardin asks, raising his hands in the air, when is the day, then? God, can you believe this guy? Not Christmas. I haven't seen your mother in years, and this is the time you choose to bring all of this up? You haven't seen her in years, because you fucking left. You left us with nothing, no fucking money, no car, nothing. Hardin shouts and steps into his father's face. Ken's face gets red with anger. And then he's yelling. No money? I send money every month. A lot of money. And your mum wouldn't accept the car that I offered her. Liar. Hardin blows out a hard breath. You didn't send shit. That's why we lived in that crap house, and she worked 50 hours a week. Hardin he isn't lying, Trish interjects. Hardin's head snaps around to his mother. What? This is a disaster. A much bigger disaster than I saw coming. He sent money, Hardin, she explains. She puts her glass down and comes over to him. Where's the money, then? Hardin asks his mother, disbelief clear in his tone. Paying your tuition. Hardin points an angry finger at Ken. You said he was paying the tuition, he yells, and my heart aches for him. He is, with the money, that I've saved over the years. Money that he sent us. What the fuck? Hardin rubs his forehead with his hand. I move to stand behind him, and thread my fingers through his free hand. Trish puts a hand on her son's shoulder. I didn't use all of it for your tuition. I pay the bills as well. Why wouldn't you tell me this? He should be paying it, and not with money, that was meant to keep us fed, keep us in a house day to day. He turns to his father. You still left us, whether you sent money or not. You just left without, so much as a fucking call on my goddamn birthday. Excess saliva pools in the corners of Ken's mouth, and he begins blinking rapidly. What was I supposed to do, Hardin? Stay around? I was a drunk, a worthless drunk, and the two of you deserved better than what I could give you. After that night I knew I had to go. Hardin's body goes rigid, and his breathing comes in ragged breaths. Don't you speak of that night. That happened because of you. When Hardin pulls his hand out of mine, Trish looks angry, Landon looks terrified, Karen well, she continues crying, and I realize that I'm the one that's going to have to stop this. I know it did. You don't know how much I wish I could take that back, son, that night has haunted me for the last 10 years. Ken says hoarsely, clearly trying not to cry. It haunts you? I fucking watched it happen, you prick. I was there to clean up the fucking blood off the floor, while you were still out getting shit-faced. Hardin balls his fists. Karen whimpers and covers her mouth, before leaving the room. I don't blame her. I hadn't realized that I was crying until the warm tears hit my chest. I had a feeling something would happen today, but nothing like this. Ken puts his hands in the air. I know, Hardin. I know. There's nothing I can do to erase that. I'm sober now. I haven't had a drink in years. You can't hold that against me forever. Trish screams as Hardin lunges at his father. Landon rushes over to try to help, but it's too late. Hardin pushes Ken back against the china cabinet, the replacement for the one Hardin had broken months ago. Ken grabs Hardin's shirt and is trying to hold him back when Hardin's fist connects with his jaw. I stand frozen, as always, as Hardin attacks his own father. Ken manages to turn himself and Hardin around before Hardin can hit him again. Instead, Hardin punches through the glass cabinet door. Seeing the blood, I break out of my stupor and grab Hardin's shirt. His arm jerks back, knocking me into a table. A glass of red wine topples over, covering my white cardigan. Look what you did. Landon yells at Hardin and rushes over to my side. Trish is standing by the door, 
giving her son a murderous glare, and Ken looks at his broken cabinet, then me, as Hardin stops his attack against his father and turns to face me. Tessa, Tessa, are you okay? He asks. I nod mutely from the floor, watching a trail of blood running off his knuckles and down his arm. I didn't get hurt. My sweater being ruined is too trivial to mention in the middle of this chaos. Move, Hardin snaps at Landon and takes his place next to me. Are you okay? I thought you were Landon, he says and helps me up with his one, bruised but unbloodied hand. I'm fine, I repeat and move away from his touch once I'm upright. We're leaving, he growls and goes to wrap his arm around my waist. I move farther away from him. I look over at Ken as he uses the sleeve of his crisp white button down to wipe the blood off his mouth. You should stay here, Tessa, Landon urges. Don't fucking start with me, Landon, Hardin warns, but Landon doesn't seem to be phased. He should be. Hardin, stop it now, I snap. When he lets out a breath but doesn't argue, I turn to Landon. I'll be fine. It's Hardin he should be worried about. Let's go, Hardin commands, but as he walks toward the door, he looks back to make sure that I'm behind him. I'm sorry about all of this, I tell Ken as I follow Hardin. Behind me, I hear him softly say, it's not your fault, it's mine. Trish is silent. Hardin is silent. And I'm freezing. The leather seats are ice cold on my bare legs, and my wet cardigan isn't helping either. I turn the heat all the way up, and Hardin looks over at me, but I focus out the window. I can't decide if I should be angry with him. He ruined dinner and literally assaulted his father in front of everyone. However, I feel for him. He has been through so much, and his father is the root of all his problems, the nightmares, the anger, the lack of respect for women. He never had anyone to teach him how to be a man. When Hardin puts his hand on my thigh, I don't move it. My head is pounding, and I cannot believe the way everything escalated so quickly. Hardin, we have to talk about what just happened, Trish says after a few minutes. No, we don't, he responds. Yes, we do. You were way out of line. I was out of line? How can you forget everything he has done? I have not forgotten anything, Hardin. I have chosen to forgive him. I cannot hold on to anger for him. But violence is always out of line. And even short of that, that type of anger will consume you, it will take over your life, if you let it. If you hold on to it, it will destroy you. I do not want to live that way. I want to be happy, Hardin, and forgiving your father makes it much easier for me to be happy. Her strength never ceases to amaze me, and Hardin's stubbornness doesn't either. He refuses to forgive his father for his past mistakes yet he's quick to ask for my forgiveness at every turn. Hardin never forgives himself either, though. Irony at its finest. Well, I don't want to forgive him. I thought I could, but not after today. He didn't do anything to you today, Trish scolds him. You provoked him about his drinking for no good reason. Hardin removes his hand from my skin, leaving a smudge of blood behind. He doesn't get a free pass, mum. This isn't about free passes. Ask yourself this, what do you get out of being so angry with him? What does that get you besides bloody hands and the lonely life? Hardin doesn't answer. He just keeps staring straight ahead. Exactly, she says, and the rest of the ride is silent. When we get back to the apartment, I head straight for the bedroom. Do you owe her an apology, Hardin, I hear Trish say somewhere behind me. I pull my ruined sweater off and let it fall onto the floor. I slip my shoes off and push my hair from my face, tucking the strands behind my ears. Seconds later Hardin opens the bedroom door. His eyes go to the red stained fabric on the floor, then up to my face. He stands in front of me and takes my hands in his, his eyes pleading. I'm so sorry Tess. I didn't mean to push you like that. You really shouldn't have done that. Not today. I know are you hurt, he asks wiping his wounded hands against his black jeans. No. If he had physically hurt me, we would have much bigger problems. I'm so sorry. I was in a rage. I thought you were Landon I don't like when you get that way, so angry. My eyes pool with tears as I recall Hardin's hand being cut open. I know, baby. He bends his knee slightly so he's eye level with me. 
I would never hurt you purposely. You know that, don't you? His thumb traces over my temple, and I nod slowly. I do know that he would never hurt me, physically at least. I have always known that. Why did you comment on his drinking in the first place? Things were going great I say. Because he was acting like nothing happened. He was being this fucking pretentious prick, and my mom was just going along with it. Someone had to stand up for her. His voice is soft, confused, the polar opposite of how it was 30 minutes ago, when he was screaming in his father's face. My heart aches again. This was his way of defending his mother. The wrong way, but to harden it's his instinct. He pushes his hair from his forehead, blood staining his skin. Try to consider how he feels, he has to live with that guilt forever, harden, and you don't make it any easier. I'm not saying you shouldn't be angry, because that's a natural reaction, but you of all people, should be more forgiving. I, and you have to stop with the violence. You can't just go around beating people up every time you get pissed off. It's not right, and I don't like it at all. I know. He looks down at the concrete floor. I sigh and take his hands in mine. We need to get you cleaned up. Your knuckles are still bleeding. I lead him to the bathroom, to clean his wounds for what feels like the thousandth time, since I met him. Chapter 48. Tessa. Hardin doesn't even wince as I clean his wounds. I dip the towel back into the sink full of water, attempting to dilute the blood from the white fabric. He looks up at me as I stand over him. He's seated on the edge of the bathtub, and I stand between his legs. He holds his hands up once more. We need to get something to put on your thumb, I tell him as I twist the towel to wring out the excess water. It'll be fine, he says. No, look how deep it is, I scold him. The skin is already mostly scar tissue, and you just keep tearing it back open. He doesn't say anything. He just studies my face. What? I ask him. I drain the pink water and wait for him to respond. Nothing he lies. Tell me. I just can't believe you put up with my shit, he says. Me either. I smile. I watch as a frown takes over his face. It's worth it, though, I add, meaning it. He smiles, and I bring my hand to his face, running the pad of my thumb over the pit of his dimple. His smile grows. Sure it is, he says and stands up. I need a shower. He removes his shirt, before leaning down to turn the shower faucet. I'll be in the room, then, I tell him. Wait why? Take one with me? Your mother is in the other room, I explain quietly. So it's only a shower. Please? I can't refuse him. He knows this. The smirk on his face as I sign defeat proves it. Unzip me? I request and turn my back to him. I lift my hair up, and his fingers find the zipper immediately. When the green fabric hits the floor, Hardin says, I like that dress. He removes his pants and boxers, and I try not to stare at his naked body as I slide the straps of my bra down my arms. When I'm completely naked, Hardin steps into the shower, holding his hand out for me. His eyes rake down my body and stop at my thighs with a scowl. What? I try to cover myself with my arms. The blood. It's on you. He gestures to some faint red marks. It's fine. I grab the loofah and rub it against my skin. He takes it from me and covers it with soap. Let me. Hardin kneels, and I can't help the goosebumps that form on my skin at the sight of him on his knees in front of me. The loofah moves up and down my thighs, slowly circling around. The boy has a direct line to my hormones. He brings his face close to my skin, and I try not to squirm as his lips touch my left hip. He keeps one of his hands wrapped around the back of my thigh, holding me in place as he does the same to the right. Hand me the shower head, he says, breaking me from my perverted thoughts. What? Hand me it the shower head, he says again. I nod and lift the piece from its hook and hand it down to him. Looking up at me with a gleam in his eye and water dripping from his nose, he turns the head in his hand, pointing it directly at my stomach. What what are you doing? I squeak as he moves the object lower. The hot water pulses against my skin and I watch in anticipation. Does that feel good? I nod. If you think it feels good now, let's see how it feels. If we move it down, just a little lower every cell in my body is awakened, 
dancing under my skin as Hardin teasingly tortures me. I jump as the water hits me, and Hardin smirks. The water feels so good, much better than I'd ever have assumed it could. My fingers wrap into his hair, and I pull my bottom lip between my teeth to stifle my moans. His mother is in the other room, but I can't make him stop, it feels too good. Tessa Hardin probes for an answer. Same stay there. I pant, and he chuckles, pressing the water closer to me to add more pressure. When I feel Hardin's soft tongue run across me just under the water, I nearly lose my balance. It's too much, his tongue lapping with the water pulsing, and my knees shaking. Hardin I can't I'm not sure what I'm trying to say, but when his tongue moves faster, I pull his hair, hard. My legs begin to shake, and Hardin drops the shower head and uses both of his hands to hold me up. Fuck I curse quietly, hopeful that the noise of the shower will drown out my moans. I feel him smile against me, before continuing to bring me over the edge. My eyes screw shut as I allow pleasure to take over my body. Hardin pulls his mouth from mine long enough to say, come on, baby, come for me. I do just that. When I open my eyes, Hardin is still kneeling, and his hand is wrapped around his cock. It's hard and heavy in his grip. Still catching my breath, I drop to my knees. I wrap my hand around his, stroking him. Stand up, I quietly instruct. His eyes lower and he nods, getting to his feet. I bring his length to my mouth, licking the tip of him. Fucky sucks in a breath, and I lap my tongue around him. I wrap my arms around the back of his legs to keep my balance on the wet floor, and take his cock down my throat. Hardin's fingers dig into my wet hair, holding me still as he moves his hips, thrusting into my mouth. I could fuck your mouth for hours. He thrusts a little faster, and I groan. His dirty words make me tighten the suction of my lips around him, and he curses again. The animalistic way he's completely claiming my mouth is new. He has total control, and I love it. I'm going to come in your mouth, baby. He pulls at my hair a little more, and I can feel the muscles in his legs tighten under my hands, and he curses my name repeatedly as he relieves himself down my throat. After a few ragged breaths, he helps me to my feet and kisses my forehead. I think we're clean now. He smiles, licking his lips. I'd say so, I say with a ragged breath and grab the shampoo. Once both of us are actually clean and ready to get out, I run my hands along his abs, tracing the skull pattern on his stomach. My hand creeps lower, but Hardin's fingers grip my wrist to stop me. I know I'm hard to resist, but my mum is just in the other room. Have some self-control, young lady, he teases, and I swatted his arm, before climbing out of the shower and grabbing a towel. This, coming from someone who just used eye flush, unable to finish the sentence. You liked it, didn't you? He raises his eyebrow, and I roll my eyes. Go get my clothes from the room, I tell him in a bossy tone. Yes ma'am. He wraps the towel around his waist, and disappears from the steamy bathroom. I swipe my hand across the mirror, after wrapping my soaking hair in a towel. Today has been a hectic, and very stressful Christmas. I should probably call Landon later, but first I want to talk to Hardin about this moving back to England after college idea. He's never mentioned it to me before. Here. Hardin hands me a pile of clothes, and leaves me alone in the bathroom to get dressed. I'm amused to find the red lace bra, and panties set along with the sweats, and a clean black t-shirt. Clean, because the one from today is bloodied. 